Hello, hello. How is how are everyone today? Um, man, oh man. Welcome, welcome. Sorry, it's been a uh, it's been a while. The um, last week, my my kids were sick, uh, and still, still kind of having that lingering, that lingering sickness. So before, one of the things that like I was warned before you have kids is someone said to me like be prepared to be sick all the time. And I'm like, I'm never sick. Like, I'm never sick. Um, as a single man, like, I take pride to be like, I don't know, I, I don't think I've even had a cold in like seven years, haven't used any sick leave, haven't missed work, that kind of thing. And then you have kids and it's just, it's just nonstop, nonstop something. Um, I had a question before everything started about, it was from uh, Ninja Cat. Um, Ninja Cat, yeah, wrote, um, any advice on someone, uh, for people who their company wants them to specialize in an area that they don't like? Um, and this is a very broad question about life. If we want to get into like broad questions about life before we start talking, I said fire and all sorts of stuff, but like in life in general, <clears throat> People are going to prepare you and give you advice for careers where where they sort of say, well, you know, this is going to be really useful. Um, and, of course, you know, it's something incredibly boring, right? Or seems incredibly boring. The, 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 most, um, the most famous is kind of accounting, right? Like they'll say like, oh, if you study accounting, you're always going to have a job. And that's true. But then you have to be an accountant. And, and being an accountant is, is like super dull. Uh, this specifically involves like my career, like I'm an auditor and like, it's true that like getting, getting an accounting degree, like, you know, opens more doors for account for, for auditing in general. But like you then have to do like, you know, uh, actually like opening books and checking, checking, uh, invoices and, and all these kind of like resolving kind of stuff. That's just like dull as hell. Now. On the one hand, you could be like, well, why do something you hate just for some more money? And it's like, well, you know, more money does open opportunities. Like you can't, you know, it kind of all depends on what you're doing. And is it going to be really boring? Is it going to be worth it? You know, like obviously like, you know, like Red from from that 70s show has a point. Like work is called work because it's work and, and not, you know, sitting on your ass. Right. Like there's always something difficult to work. But at the same time, you want something that's like challenging and interesting and stimulating and stuff like that. So it kind of all depends on what that specialization is. And for many people, it doesn't matter what something is, you're eventually going to find it interesting. Um, you know, like something's boring if you know nothing about it, but then you get into it a little more and it starts becoming fascinating. Probably not accounting, but there are other things where you sort of like get into a specialization and you just find it just fascinating because you eventually learn the rules and the ins and outs and the and and, and things like that so i i know this is it's like you know i'm being very general but it's it's kind of a general question and it all kind of depends as i say the the joke of what do you what do you find when you stick your hands down in an old man's pants the uh the answer is depends um and so uh you know you life is about that balance. Like, obviously we're gonna, we're going to put in a little pain for a little, for a little pleasure somewhere else, you know, like whether it be money, whether it be putting in the work to eventually find something interesting that may not be interesting right now. Um, but, uh, I mean, that's the thing. The company, the company itself wants you to specialize in an area, meaning, you know, they want you to stay on and become like an asset, um, a kind of uh, something that they can't get rid of. So, I mean, you're talking about job security and things like that. There's a lot of pluses, you know. Um, but of course, like, you know, the, the artist inside of me is like, live your dreams, man. Go for what you want to do. Be it, you know, like, but so it kind of all depends on what it is, you know. <laughs> but this is the thing easy solution abolish all the capitalism and the need of work i was actually watching a, a little bit of a video by a there's a youtuber named yugo pink and 
Hugo Pink is like a Marxist, but he's very entertaining and he gets into sort of like these deeper meanings and stuff of, of like, of um, like why capitalism fails. And it's not that like, I am a capitalist still. So I always think it's interesting to hear the takes um, because they always take it too far. You know, they're like, as if like every person in the capitalist system is, is just like grinding, trying to make it up, like up the ladder and, and, and failing miserably. And it's just miserable because like all of their life's ambitions are in their job. And that's just not how human beings are. Like human beings are actually quite balanced. Like we have our friends and family and job is just one thing that we do to get money most of the time. And we don't think about it. Like, you know, it's not, it's not this like, you know, grinding cycle of poverty where because I've, because I, I can't rise in, in my position, I'm just you know, incredibly unhappy and miserable. Like that's not how most people are. Like most people, yeah, if they're in a dead end job, they're in a dead end job. It doesn't matter. They find, they find like happiness through their friends and family and hobbies and things like this. So it's not that I don't like, it's not like I don't understand the points. Like it is true that like, you know, when you're in school, people will push you away from the arts and poetry in order to, in, in order to become, you know, bankers or something that, that, that society needs but that doesn't really mean that you're like not going to be happy or fulfilled like there's i know plenty of people that have like jobs that i think would be deathly boring where i would be unhappy in them but they're quite happy like they're just like yeah i go to work like i talk to my friends during breaks like you know most of the time you're bitching about like office pressure and office politics and and you know you get a nice check at the end of the day and you know they're really just focused on like their friends and families and hobbies and things like this so uh, i mean it's it's a horrible answer to just say like oh what should i do like if a company is trying to get me to specialize it's a lot it depends like how much do you hate the issue that they're pushing you into like how much benefit do you get from it how many other job opportunities do you have like what is it so I don't, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's all about like figuring out that balance. Um, and that goes for everything. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was in college in my early twenties being like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do with my life? And at the end of the day, it doesn't really kind of matter too much. Like you're probably going to be happy no matter what you do. Um, you know? you're probably going to meet somebody and have a family and have friends and like find what you do interesting no matter what. Like it, 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 it's fun. Like I'm not such a, like a, like I don't have much like doom when it comes to like most people's lives. Like most people are actually kind of happy as, as much as like people think otherwise, like, you know, so I don't know. I don't know. Um, what a, what do we now? Should we get into Howland? Or everybody's talking about The Last of Us. I know I'm interfering with Last of Us, but there's also like today is a Taiwan holiday, and my kids are home from from daycare, and my and my wife is is um, taking care of things. So I just uh, I, I I can't uh, I couldn't I couldn't wait another hour to for for uh, for Last of Us to be over. Though I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dragon Demands wants to rock. <laughs> I, I must have under, misunderstood the subject of this video. So should we get into Howland Reed? Like any ideas from people? I'll leave this open on like why Howland Reed is such a dick. Like is so Howland Reed. How does Howland land his castle? Nothing makes sense about Howland Reed. So in a Game of Thrones, Howland Reed is supposed to be Ned's best friend friend you know this is the dude that saved him with the tower of joy he's repeatedly called like ned's best friend and rob says says things like oh like ned knew the value of howland reed and stuff like this and so rob calls his banners and howland reed sends nobody it's actually even worse than this he calls his banners and lewin says to rob oh the Cranic men are going to be waiting for you on the king's road none of them show up Fucking, fucking stand him up. Ghost him. They say, oh, we're totally going to be part of your, part of your, no, the, nothing. Just like, you know, they don't show. They, I think somehow f say they're going to show and then they don't show. So that's just like, I would say dickhead move number one and two. Like call the banners, don't show up. 
and then like say you're going to show up and then not show up, you know, like, okay. So then, then people say, well, you know, Rob commands them to actually defend the neck against Lannister movements of which <clears throat> they didn't do it. Like they didn't, they didn't like the Boltons march straight up the neck with the phrase and they didn't stop him at all. Like it, it, he, he says like, oh, they should bleed them like every step of the way. They did nothing. They did, they did absolutely nothing, um, against, against, uh, well, that's the thing. I don't know. You know, is he really the best friend? I mean, George R. R. Martin kind of changes his mind on things. As, as, as we found out in the original, it was John Aaron at the Tower of Joy. So this is kind of all just, so they bleeded. No, <clears throat> they bleeded. They didn't bleed the Lannisters at all. Like no Bolton's phrase, like got bled at all. So complete, like defying Rob's orders. It's seemingly three times, like call the banners, not show up at the King's road and then like not actually do anything to defend against the Lannisters as they went up. So Holland is as useless as a tipped over scarecrow. Yes. Now some people say, well, oh, uh, you know, they, they totally, you know, stopped Victorian or, or were a thorn in the side of Victorian. And it, it's like not really. So Victorian like Mart like sails his fleet into the neck, gets out of his ships Marches all the way, gets Moat Caitlin. And yeah, they, they start shooting some arrows at Moat Caitlin. So like, you know, they got like 30 dudes shooting arrows at Moat Caitlin. Nobody goes for his ships. Like nobody attacks his ships. He's just able to like chill out at Moat Caitlin forever. Yeah, maybe a few people got ticked, you know, hit with poison arrows. And then and then Victorian leaves. And yeah, Victorian hates, hates them. He calls them bog devils from then on, but like nothing. And then they leave, and then we never hear about Howland again. Like, um, like, so I just, you know, what was he doing? Like, yeah, Victorian left his ships. Cranning men did nothing. Like, what? So, uh, did they defend against the Ironborn, or was that just in the show? They they annoy the Ironborn at Moat Kalen, the the the, the Cranning men. That's it. Like they, Victorian does say that he's, he wears his armor day and night because he's fearful of like Cranning Man Arrow, like hitting him. And he, he seems to not like the bog devils, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not much. So then people say, okay, well maybe, you know, he sent his kids, he sent his kids to Bran. So isn't that something, you know, it's like, okay, I guess, um, but, you know, that's, that's it. Um, and then even then, like, what, what is that? You know, like, how does that relate to not fighting in a war? Um, since House of the Dragon, I think anytime we go, huh, this guy doesn't make sense. Uh, it's just prophecy causing him to act illogically. It's true. And I realized, like, for years, I kind of, like, did that as a crutch. Like, I find something that doesn't make sense in the story. And it's either... I, you know, prophecy is motivating this person because it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like everything Rhaegar does, like everything Rhaegar does doesn't make any sense. So you're like, okay, I guess he's just motivated by prophecy, you know, like, oh, okay. Like, um, or it's some sort of master plan that we don't quite understand yet. And I understand that like I fall into this, right? Like, you know, Stannis is being crazy in the north. Not everything he's doing is making sense. Well, it's because Stannis is a master military planner and he has, like, the thing going on. The Dornish story makes no sense at all. There must be a Dornish master plan. You know, like, uh, you know, I get it. I get it. Um, and so there's that or it's prophecy. Like, uh, this and this doesn't make sense. Rhaegar? Rhaegar's stupid. Prophecy. Howland Reed? Howland Reed's stupid. He doesn't make any sense. Prophecy, you know. Um... Um, <clears throat> oh, big fan of your content. When Littlefinger says Lynn Corbray likes gold boys and killing, does he mean boys like Renly or Loras or boys? Um, this is, um, this gets into, there's some bias in the story with regards to how, uh, ice and fire 
sees homosexuals. Um, and so any and every homosexual in the story is conflated with a pedophile. And that's just the way the characters are. So I would say that Lynn Corbray is actually like, say he, say Lynn Corbray is gay. We don't really have any evidence that he's a pedophile other than little fingers like claim that he's a pedophile. Um, but at the same time, like everybody is anti-gay and like the, you know, even in our own society, like right now in this modern time, people associate like conflate wrongly homosexuality and pedophilia that, oh, they're gay. They must be into little boys. Um, and we can see this in, in Fire and Blood, like Lenore is specifically said to hang out with, bo with men his own age. You know, and the two men that we know that he hangs out with, um, Joffrey Lonmouth and Carl Corey, are his own age. And yet, when it comes time to overthrow, like, the, the throne, Kristen Cole says, like, oh, Lenor, you know, him and his love of little boys, we're gonna, they're going to turn the, the Red Keep into a brothel. You know, and so, all of a sudden, like, Lenor is a pedophile even though there's no evidence, there's very little evidence that he's even gay. But like, even if he were gay, there's there's no evidence that he's a pedophile. So Lynn Corbray, like, you know, Lynn Corbray may be a dickhead, you know? He may be gay. There's no, there's no evidence that he's, that he's a pedophile other than Littlefinger's, like, claim, which, one, it's Littlefinger, but two, like, the entire Ice and Fire world is anti-gay. And let's not, you know, let's not forget that. So I don't think, I think it's, it's like wrong to jump to the conclusion that Lynn Corbray is, is, is a pedophile because everybody just labels gay people pedophiles in this story. So, um, what is the end game of the Holy Hundred? Um, I mean, I think that, uh, the end game of the Holy Hundred was I don't think they have an end game. I think that the Holy Hundred is Bonifer Hasty's like religious crew. Um, according to Bonifer Hasty, they're just there to defend Heron Hall until Littlefinger takes control of it. And they're, they're just like some religious dudes. Um, so I don't think they have a master plan. I think that, you know, they, they just, you know, are religious and are going to do what they think is religiously right. Now, in, in, the, in the fanfic, I had Bonifer Hasty um, switch allegiances and go to Aegon, which, um, which I think makes sense for, for a number of reasons. Like, the Hasties are from the Stormlands. And so he's also, if <clears throat> Aegon is the, the son of Rhaegar, um, Bonifer Hasty was in love with Rhaegar's mother. And so he would want to support Rhaegar's child. Also, the Hasties, the Hasties tent is seen at the um, the Butterwell, the Frey Butterwell wedding from the Mystery Night, and so there's this idea that the Hasties might have been Blackfire supporters, and so if Aegon is Blackfire, um, the Hasties would support they would support them as well, and so I felt it was just quite logical that that Bonifer Hasty would, if once he found out that Aegon was there, would declare for for Aegon, and it would be such a symbol. To the to the to the kingdom that that Aegon has has Harrenhal, and so you know I generally thought that that's where the story was was going to be going because Aegon needs to conquer the Westeros pretty quick so that he can have Westeros for for Danny to come in and have a fight, and so I, I just kind of think that um, that's where it was, but I don't think there's any sort of master plan. I, I I think that they just are are religious dudes that you know are very dedicated to to the faith of the Seven, you know, not quite sparrows, but you know, there. Um, Howland was a time was time warged by Bran at the Tower of Joy. He never recovered, um, which is why we never see him and how his line is now tied to Bran. Now, I definitely think that realistically, like in George's planning of of the um, of the series, that he doesn't really understand. Like he doesn't really know where the story is going. And so there's a lot of like, I really think about like Corin Halfhand's like statements in the Clash of Kings about like old powers rising and things like this. Like, like 
Corn Halfhand finds out that John is a warg, and then goes and sees Mance Raider, um, like with giants, uh, you know, in the Frost Fangs, and his big message to 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 Jira Mormont is, oh, the old powers are awakening, you know, it's it's time. And that doesn't make any sense. The cold winds rise. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, the giants always existed. Like, wargs always existed. Like, there's no, there was no awakening. The awakening is, is the others. But there's no... Corrin Halfhand doesn't, like, run into any others and stuff like that. So it's just, like, it's clearly, like, George just, like, doesn't know where the story's going. So he writes all of these things that sound like that sound really impressive like oh man big stuff is happening in the future corin corin like he just doesn't make any sense at all and so like howland reed i think it's kind of a similar situation like well we're howland he's visited the isle of faces and he was at the tower of joy and he's got all these secrets and 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 his kids go forward to to bran and they they make some vow of ice and fire to him and then you know, Jojen says some mysterious stuff and then, and then nothing. Like it turns out Jojen knows, Jojen is bullshitting. He doesn't know anything. They get behind, they get beyond the wall and Jojen is like a scared little boy and it just wants to die. And Mira doesn't even believe in prophecy and, and, and thinks the whole, it's all bullshit. And you just kind of realize that like George is just like making shit up as he goes along, which he literally is. This is the whole thing about writing stories. Um, and that, uh, you know, that like this, this, this idea of like how, like this master plan of like what Howland knows and how it's all going to fit together and all answers will be, will, will, will happen. Like, like realistically, I don't think George knows. Like, I just don't think, like, I think that he wrote Howland Reed as this really important character. And then he doesn't really have a very logical reason for why. He's not in the story other than, you know, he's got all the answers. He's, he's going to be my mystery chest where all the answers are going to come. Um, and then it's just, he just doesn't know what to do with him. But, and then it's saying like, oh, maybe the reason he didn't come and, and, and support everybody is that, you know, his castle moves around and the Ravens couldn't find it. And there's just miscommunication. I don't know. But could he be like, could he be Bran, time traveling Bran sense? <sighs> I mean, I could see why someone would think that, you know, like going to visit the Isle of Faces and and being at the Tower of Joy and, and stuff like that and um, doing everything to get Bran to go forward because he's part of the, the time the time loop. Um, I mean, I guess that's how I think that's how I would write it. Like when the Bran chapters come and the time travel, at least, you know, at least Bran, he would act... I don't know if, like, at the Tower of Joy he'd be warged by Bran, because that doesn't really make sense, because Bran would be affecting his own birth. But maybe after Bran is born, like, he's, he's get it, he starts getting visions and, and acts like a weirdo or something. Um, huh. Bolton means, in Russian, means swamp. Bolotin. Roos Bolton uses leeches called Leech Lord, which live in swamps. Maybe a connection to Howland. Maybe. George does throw leeches into his other stories. He just kind of thinks they're creepy animals. Um, he thinks leeches and eels are creepy animals. And so in a lot of his stuff before Ice and Fire, you'll, you'll, you'll find mentions of leeches and, 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 um, and, and eels. The Boltons are like the last frontier of ice and fire that I haven't really looked into that I haven't, you know, done a theory on. I never like Roose Bolton seems to be up to something weird when he's at Heron hall, you know, like he's reading some mysterious book and he throws it in the fire. And for some reason, this leather book like goes up in flames, even though leather doesn't burn. Um, and, and then he, for some reason, feels it's really, really important to be at the Red Wedding and stab Jamie Lannister, or, I mean, stab Rob himself and say Jamie Lannister sends his regards. Like, totally not necessary for him to do that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, why he's keeping Ramsey around, even though Ramsey is clearly harmful 
and why he like seems okay with his son being killed or he somewhat laments it even that 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 that, that Ramsey killed his son he, but he still like supports Ramsey and he doesn't seem to age and he does these weird leeches and is there an answer to it all or is just George throwing a bunch of creepy elements all at once at a wall and hoping they stick and just being like well he's creepy he uses leeches man leeches are creepy he doesn't age. That's creepy. He's got these eyes that are ice. That's creepy. You know, he has weird feelings about his family and their deaths. That's creepy. You know, so, um, so I don't know. Like, this is why like bolt-on theory comes around to try to make sense of of Bruce Bolton, um, because nothing Bruce Bolton does makes sense. And like bolt-on, as as stupid as it is, and it is stupid, and it definitely is not the truth. Like, Bolton is not the truth, but I admit that Bolton makes more sense than the current story. So, it's, it's, <laughs> so I don't know. It makes, it, it makes more sense than the current story, but it, it, it's, it's definitely not the truth. It's definitely not what's going on. I think George just kind of threw a bunch of creepy elements at Bruce Bolton and doesn't know, doesn't know. I mean, for the fanfic, we're going to figure something out that makes sense. Um, but, uh, you know, it's. I don't know if George has an idea. Um, what happens to your fanfic if The Winds of Winter releases earlier? Uh, well, you know, it's just uh, it was something fun, and it was just uh, it was just something that was there. Um, I mean, it exists, and and I think it's fun that it exists. Uh, I don't think there's anything bad, but um, you know, The Winds of Winter best case scenario it comes out in like two years. That's like best case scenario. Right. Um, by then, you know, we'll have like something around 30 chapters of the fanfic. It'll be about, you know, plus the, the, the sample chapters. So it'd be like a little more than half done. Like, you know, if something like that happens, you know, oh, well, you know, it was really fun. It was really fun doing. We've got this fanfic out there. It's just, you know, and, and that's it. But, um, you know, you know, I play around with the idea that like that um i could i could um 50 shades of gray it you know like so 50 shades of gray started out as um uh um uh, the vampire um twilight fanfic like it started out as twilight fanfic and she just like changed the names um so, I mean, if something like that happened, you know, maybe we discussed, like, you know, maybe 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 it could be, like, salvageable writing for for its own story. I don't know. But, I, you know, I don't think The Winds of Winter is going to release, you know. So, I think the fanfic will probably beat The Winds of Winter. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But there's different ideas. I mean, right now, we're just having fun. We're, write, we're writing stories. Um, and, uh... You know, it's, we'll see what happens. What would be, what would be rough is you get to the point where you like completely finish and then the winds of winter comes out and then you've got these two things sitting next to each other. Um, uh, <clears throat> do you think Alicent and Cole were together? This is a very interesting kind of, um, I just was thinking about this like in serious, like, with my last um, overanalyzing that like, you know, I, you know, I, I definitely lead to lean towards the fact that like Rhaenyra and Cole were together and that, and that just because that the, in the advent of the character in George R. R. Martin's mind during a feast for crows, that's definitely like something he had in his mind. They were romantic. Um, but weirdly, it, like when fire and blood comes out, like, there's less evidence that Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole had a romance. I still think that they did, but none of the characters actually think they had sex. Like Septon Eustace thinks that there's a profession of love, but no sex. And then Mushroom thinks there's a profession of love and no sex. So neither, neither side even thinks they got together. Um, though I do think that they were together, which is like the original Aries Oakheart like idea about, about them. Um, 
But then it gets into like, well, what about Allison? Doesn't it make more sense that like he's banging Allison? Um, and yeah, I mean, there's, I think they're playing with it in the show too that he's in love with her. Um, it's an interesting idea, and and there was there was a couple lines that were removed, but there's a there, like there's a whole like the romance between Damon and Allison was also removed from Fire and Blood. Um, that these rumors that that Damon had sex with Allison uh, early on, and that the the reason that Otto Hightower and Damon hate each other is that is that Damon took Allison's maidenhead. Um, and then there was this like, you know, just little lines like Allison was very pleased when she gave her her um, her favor to to Cole. So you know, it, it's an interesting idea going forward about whether or not. The real romance is them. Though I don't think there's much like there. Um, what'd be funny is if like <laughs> be funny as if like as well, like well, I'm like the timing is off, but I'm like, could Daron there's a ch- could Daron be Kristen Cole's timing wise? Um because Kristen doesn't really have the time or opportunity to be the father of Aegon, um, Helena, or Aemond. But could he be the father of Daron? Um, Because Daron is born about nine months after after, um, after, uh, he becomes the sworn shield for Alicent. Um, And what do we know about Daron? Um, I'm trying to think of like what like what's Daron's look. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Firstborn. Here we go. Daron the Tar- Targaryen. Had the coloring of the blood of the dragon, a handsome boy. The thing is, we we don't know what Allison looks like, unfortunately. So, courteous and clever, the gentlest of brothers. That's it. Um, I mean, it'd be funny if like Daron this whole time didn't have silver hair, and that he was actually like, um, and that's like the reason he's like sent away and things like this is that he looks like Kristen Cole or something. Um, I mean, there, there, you can get into some interesting tinfoil about whether or not Daron is Kristen Cole's. Uh, I think it's worth exploring in the future to, to think about the possibility. Um, <clears throat> Greywater Watch equals Greywater Station. Everything about Howland and Kranig. Uh, the Cranig men need to be viewed for the prism of the old gods, children manipulation from Heron Hall's false spring to Jojen Mira. Um, so th- what this is referring to is that George R. R. Martin has a story called Men of Greywater Station, of which Greywater Watch is named after. And in the story, the Men of Greywater Station is about a... F- it's, it's kind of the last of us. Like, it's about a planet that's covered in fungus, where the fungus controls has gotten on every plant and animal in the entire on the entire planet and controls them as a hive mind um and so the 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 um the scientists kind of land and are wondering if they can use this um uh fungus as a bioweapon against the Findian Harangans, which they're they're in war with and so, you know, they're kind of like, but the fungus eventually starts sending dreams to the men and they start fighting amongst themselves and um, everything kind of collapses and, uh, you know, the, um, and that's it. Like, you know, the, the protagonist at the end is kind of just left there, like in this pile of rubble, like looking at the stars as like fungus spores like come down on him and. You know, like the cut, the story cuts off. Like obviously, ninety nine point nine percent chance that that the protagonist is dead, um, and so you know this idea that yeah, like dreams and sending dreams and manipulation and like um, 
being tricked and betrayal is like definitely part of um, the gray water kind of idea. And so, you know, Howland and everything might be, you know, be, be tricked and manipulated, you know, so. Um, is Bonifer's previous relationship relevant? I mean, I think it's relevant in the sense that like Bonifer might, or at least people would think that he's going to be start, like he's going to uh, be doing things because he likes Ares's, because he was in love with, with Ares's wife, uh, Rayla. Um, but his true, it might, it might be good in the sense that, um, in the sense that it's a cover, like everyone would be sitting there saying, Oh, he's doing this because he was in love with Rayla. He was in love with Rhaegar's, uh, mother. And therefore he's supporting Aegon. And his secret reason is that he's, he's a black fire. Um, so, I mean, his previous relationship might be relevant in the, in that, it's the true motivation or it might be relevant in that it's the cover for his true, true motivation. So, um, uh, do you think the wall will fall and how, um, you know, prior to the show showing the wall fall, I didn't think the wall was going to fall. I thought it was a, a red herring, like the whole story. You're like, when's the wall going to fall? When's the wall going to fall? And then everybody's going to either go through underneath it, through Gorn's way or around it at the bridge of skulls. Like you don't need to do anything. You don't need to bring down the wall. Um, but, uh, and so like the only thing that made me kind of change about that was like, okay, well in the show, we had the white dragon and the white dragon like burned down the wall. And that's like such a bold move for D and D that I almost think the white dragon was a George R. Martin idea. And so, you know, you know, I think that may, you know, maybe that's a possibility. I don't think any of the horns are going to do it. Like, I understand that like Sam has a horn and everybody's like, Oh, that's the real horn of winter. And he's going to like, bring down the wall with that. I don't think any horns are bringing down the wall. Um, you know, how I would do it is that the others either go through Gorn's way or around the Bridge of Skulls. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And that the wall stays up. And then all the events happen. And then in sort of an epilogue, there's this idea of the wall, like the, like the people disassembling the wall as uh, you know in, in in the in the epilogue as like a, as a choice um because you know the wall might have something to do with like why the seasons are uneven and th things like that um that's that's sort of what's written into the fanfic um r relating to things because the wall is definitely like part of why the the seasons are out of whack in the fanfic um and so like i would guess that that, that they're kind of related in in george r, r. martin's mind that the wall somehow is also affecting the seasons and that by bringing down the wall, you're actually like bringing balance to the earth again. Um, so, I, you know, I do think the wall is going to come out, come down, but I think it's more powerful in my mind, in my opinion, that the wall is brought down by like humans choosing to bring down the wall rather than, you know, dragon knocking, knocking a hole in it or the others like knocking a hole in it. Or, you know, the, the Horn of Winter magically bringing it down or things like that, you know. Um, anyway, but that's just that's just my random opinion. But because um, George, George is all about like massive subversion and like having a the dragon thing, you know, might be George's. So if it, if it were if it were George's, I think George is doing the white dragon in his mind and burning a hole in the wall. But I think George is. You know, it's also so much like George to be like, yeah, no, we got this huge, we got this huge wall and it's going to totally come down and never comes down, you know? Um, like, I just think of like Fever Dream. So Fever Dream, you're like, they've got this like boat, the whole, the whole uh, story. And then the boat kind of goes out of commission. And then there's this like story they're like oh man the boat's back on the water and we got to go and have one last big battle on that boat and there's got to be a big rumble and then they go and they and actually the boat was not actually like recommissioned and it's 
until like on land and it's 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 like a relic and there's not one huge battle it's just like two dudes like having having a having a fight like there's no there's no epic showdown it was kind of a whimper um and that's how dying of the light ends and and how like, kind of how armageddon rag ends too like you think you know they're, they're building up that there's going to be this big armageddon with demons and everything and then it's just no there's not and and it's just kind of a um you know he subverts everything so this idea of, you know, is there going to be, yeah, but what's the, what's going to be the subversion? Is there going to be a big, big battle and then it's subverted? Is there is the wall going to come down and then it's subverted? You know, George has to subvert something like, so I don't know. I think if it, if it comes down, it's the dragon, but I think that it's not coming down otherwise. Um, I always assumed that Howland stayed away in the neck at Ned's command because he knew too much about what happened at the end of Robert's Rebellion. That's a good, that's a good, um. It's a good idea, but one thing that's odd is that Ned does try to contact Howland and his letters go unanswered, um, which is a bit of a contradiction because they're like later they're like, oh, well, Ravens can't find Howland, can't find the um, the uh, the castle because it moves. You're like, well, then how did you have ravens in the first place? Like, why would anybody like send ravens out? Like, what was the maester doing? Like. You know, like if the if the castle moves around, like why would a maester go there and train a bunch of ravens to have that be the location, and then bring those ravens to Winterfell, and then have Ned like send off those ravens to not find like the freaking castle? Like what 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 was going on? <laughs> like or did he just like send letters in a different fashion, and they're not ravens? You know, and like how does Lewin know that the Cranig men are supposed to show up at the King's Road if? If he doesn't, if he didn't send off ravens to do that, but why would anyone like have ravens for a moving castle? Like it, it just doesn't make any sense. Like nothing with Howland Reed makes any sense. Like Ned, Ned, like you know, tells him to hide, but then he sends letters, like trying to communicate with him, and Howland like ghosts him, never responds to any of his letters. So he's just fucking dickhead, Howland Reed. Uh, most interesting plot line that, that George R. R. Martin dropped later on. Um, <sighs> trying to think of like super interesting ones. Like I say, like there's there's little ones like like sellsword companies disappearing and um, the 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 religious zealots um, in in King's Landing disappearing. You know, Al Ardim, that kind of stuff. I'm trying to think. Um, of something that like is definitively dropped or if it's going to come back later. That's also tough. Like is something going to come back later? Um, you know, like we kind of feel that like Rob's ships are going to come back later or, um, but we have no real proof that those ships are coming back. I think um, the most interesting plots that, that are dropped that haven't come back that I, that I fear are not going to come back is probably like, Corin Halfhand's companions and what Corin Halfhand was doing and like his backstory and everything related to that. Like Stone Snake. Um, I think I don't know if we're ever gonna deal with with any of that. And that was that was you know, half of the John story of a clash of kings is is Corin Halfhand, and you know, we, we may never get a a um we may, may never get a really good resolution to that, which is which is too bad. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that's like just like dropped for for no reason. That's like there's little things about like Edmure and his like care for the small folk and him going out like going to the the brothels that goes nowhere. Um, the uh, the four assassins that that's that um that Tyrion like plans to use, like there's this big buildup of this four assassins and they never go anywhere either. Um, uh, there, they, you know, there's 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 some little things like that. Um, I'm trying to think of anything, anything else that. Uh, um, through, oh, Renly's. Fucking Renly's plan 
Oh, man. Renly's plan went nowhere. Um, in a, so, if, for those who don't remember, in a Game of Thrones, like Renly had a plan to bring Mar- Marjorie to court and have Marjorie marry Robert. And which is a big deal because that means you're like, whoa, does that mean like Renly knows about the incest? Because he doesn't act like he knows about the incest later on. Did he really think that like Robert was going to set Cersei aside and and get with Marjorie without pushing Cersei aside because of the incest and the war and war and things like this? Um it's actually a fairly like large part of a game of thrones like renly goes up to to ned and is like shows him a picket picture of marjorie and is like oh do you think this looks like liana and ned's like no that doesn't look like liana at all and like illyrio and varis like chat about like oh we don't know what the what the uh what loris and renly are up to they're they're up they're doing some scheming and then the scheming goes nowhere like it's it's that's Ren- Renly, 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 and Loris's scheming is probably the most interesting thing I think that was dropped. Like, whoa, these are power players. These are like people in the Game of Thrones that are scheming. No, no, they, they, it's we're we're just never going to talk about it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> um, Do you not name the editors to protect them from possible legal issues, or because they're Ely on Brandon Sanderson? Uh, would great to have them. Would be great to have them on. Um, I, I, uh, people, people are allowed to use whatever names um, they they like. I, some people want privacy, and and I want to respect their privacy. So like, I, I, I list their names. If they if they want their names listed, and I I don't if they don't. Um, but generally speaking, like I, you know, I don't want to be like uh, naming them by names and, and and throwing their names around in case they want, in case they just generally want privacy on the internet, which is which is what a lot of people do. I mean, if if people are, you know if uh, if if people want to be like you know loud about who they are, like like I am. Um, they, they can, but you know, a lot of people are, it, it's their privacy is very important. For instance, Carmine, his privacy is very important. And, um, which is why like, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about Carmine's real name. We don't talk about like, he doesn't show his face, things like this. So it's mainly just like respect for respect for other people and like how much, how much they want to be public. So, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, obviously as well. I don't think anything legal is going to happen at all, but I think we're too small for anyone to pay attention. And I don't think there would be any legal issues because we're not selling anything. There's no, um, we're no there's no money making on it. So, uh, but um, yeah, that's, uh, but that's it. But yeah, you know, the, 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 editor, the editors are, 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 are all interesting and they all have, uh, um, they all have their, uh, their 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 own ideas about things and so, things like that. They're 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 they're, uh, they're a good bunch. Um, Bran is stealing people's free will. Shouldn't he be George R. R. Martin's villain? Evil Bran, not evil Danny. Or does George R. R. Martin think time traveling Bran's endgame is worth free will? Um, this is the big contradiction of time travel in general, right? That like. If you, if people had free will, you know, and, and say, say like one day you're walking down the street and you know, like, oh, should I take, should I turn right or should I turn left today to get, to, to go to work? And it doesn't matter. You know, you just kind of throw your, some days you go right and some days you go left and you just kind of pick it randomly out of your free will. If you replayed history over and over again, there should be no reason that you would do the same thing every time if free will were were a real thing. So anytime you have time loops where like everything is ha- like happening the same way again, you're, you're kind of taking away everybody's free will. And the only person that has free will is the time traveler. Like they're changing things. Um, 
And so it's the odd thing. I mean, whether it's Back to the Future or whatever, like, oh, over the course of history, none of these people had free will. They, they redid the same thing over and over and over again the same way. Um, so it doesn't really make sense that, like, Bran is the only one with free will. And this is definitely a huge discussion about, like, the whole story is a discussion about, like, free will and, um, and morality and things like this. Uh, so it's odd that Bran is the only one with free will in the entire story. Um, if he's in a time loop, and I do think he's in a time loop, um, that no one else, you know, like, if there's a random dis- decision that changes things, like, what's, what's, you know, why is it never, why is it never changed? And clearly somebody is, like, shifting with people's minds, like, Jamie waking up and wanting to go back and save Brienne. Like, clearly somebody, like, made him trigger that his mind to make a different decision. It's just odd that it's, like, Bran's the only one that, that really has free will in the story and that everybody else is, is just kind of a pawn. Um, but it's the contradiction of time and, you know, free will shouldn't exist, right? We all kind of believe, like the thing about like time travel is we kind of all accept the, the notion that, that everything exists in cause and effect. And if everything exists in cause and effect, then there's no free will. Like everything has a reason to get to that point, you know? Because if, if it were, every time you'd replay the timeline, we'd have different results. But, um, <laughs> this is the bol- the bolt-on theory I'm way back. Bolt-on theory is, is, is the idea that, that, um, uh, uh, Bruce Bolton is a, is a, is a vampire who, like, moves his soul from, like, body to body and is, like, grooming Ramsey to be, like, the, the host for his new, like, soul that he's going to pass pass on or into, into something that's uh that's the idea or or that he's like he doesn't age because he's a vampire um uh and and he's 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 gonna keep rams around so that he can have his blood or something to like fund his body there's all sorts of ideas but the idea is that Roose bolton generally is immortal and is using other people as as either a new vessel to constantly like swap his mind into or as like fuel blood to keep his own body going it's one of the two there's different variants on the bolt-on theory theory holland reader's last scene of frog <laughs> it'd be funny if you like finally find holland reed and he's riding just this this giant this giant uh, giant frog um, didn't Mira say that they had no castellan or arms trainer? Wouldn't that imply that, that, uh, they have no men to send? Um, so they would have no knights to send, but keep in mind that like, um, under feudalism, like the people that are getting sent are the farmers, right? They're just like random dudes in the field. And they're, they're like, up oh, time to go to war. And you grab these random dudes who are farmers and you, put spears in their hands and they're off. So, you know, the Castellan and arms trainers, those are only for like the knights and highborn people. Um, so, and, and, and keep in mind that like to be a knight, it, it's kind of like training for the Olympics. Like if, if you've ever like looked at the background of a lot of these people that are in the Olympics, um, a lot of them come to for, come from really well to do families. Because, like, who has the money and time to go out and luge every day? You know, like, it's not like you or I could be like, oh, yeah, no, you know, I, you know, I, I go I, every once in a while, I just go out and I luge. Like, no, like, you need to have, like, the time to luge every single day and the resources to go to a, a luge center to luge and have your own sled and and luge constantly to get to the point like where you could be going into the Olympics, right? The same thing with knighthood. Like in order to have the time to just sit around and practice fighting all day, every day to be a really good fighter, you have to be highborn. You have to be idle. Like every everybody else is sitting there toiling. Like they they got jobs, right? And if you have a job, I mean you don't have time to to, to train. So like knights knights are really good fighters because they're rich. Um. And so 
it, but the average Joe who's fighting in these wars, when we hear about the twenty thousand people that that are going with Rob, like those are those are just farmers. Those are those are sustenance people that like every day they're going out there and hitting the dirt, and uh, they don't really have much ability to fight. And so when you hear these stories about a knight going in and slaughtering twenty men, it's fairly realistic because like one guy trains every single day, all day, and that's what he does because he's freaking bored and rich and the farmer has had no military training at all. You know, like say, say we had an MMA fighter and he's, and he's supposed to like fight like 20 random college kids. How do you think that's going to go? You know, like maybe the 20 college kids might all work together and like get that MMA fighter down, but the MMA fighter is probably going to beat them all up, you know? So it's got, it's kind of a similar situation, but yeah, no, these, he's got plenty of these, these bog devils, Bug devils, you know, they're, they're doing something. I mean, I'm saying, you know, they live there, right? They must be collecting, I don't know what you'd eat in a bog. Um, you know, I guess they, people that collect shrimp. Um, people that like get moss off trees that and eat the moss. I don't, I don't know what they're eating in a bog, but those guys would still go out and like fishermen, you know, you, you'd still send them to war. Um, any point of view characters you don't intend to make fanfic? Um, Aries Oakhart? Ned? <laughs> Aries Oakhart and Ned will probably never have a, uh, a point of view. But everybody else at some point, I think even John, who I don't think I'm going to bring back as like, a person is probably still going to have a point of view as ghost. Um, everybody else, everybody else. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to have their, they're going to have their, um, their turn, you know, um, though it, you know, we got it. We do, do have to start shrinking, shrinking, um, uh, the point of views and stuff like that. Get rid of some of them. I'm tempted to, tempted to get rid of Tyrion as a point of view at some point, as much as like Tyrion is like the favorite. Right. But, like if he meets up with Danny, like there's no real need for Tyrion to have a point of view, or or you know unless you drop the Danny point of view. So I don't know. It's um or they just have fewer point of views. Ah, uh, I don't know. But everybody so far, except for Ari Ari Sokard and and Ned. Uh, somebody asked earlier if um if there's any point of view if anybody dies in their point of view and doesn't come back, uh, besides epilogues and prologues. Nobody dies in their points of view and doesn't come back. So the only character to die in their point of view is Catelyn. And she comes back. Ned does not die in his point of view. Aerys Okart does not die in his point of view. Um, even if you believe Quentin is dead, he doesn't die in his point of view. He, you know, even if you believe that Quentin is dead, he gets burned and he's in bed for a week and then dies. Um, in somebody else's point of view. So like nobody dies in their point of view except for Catalan who who comes back. And and then all the prologues and epilogues. And even then, like um uh Chet doesn't die in his point of view. Um but everybody else does, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um The most ironic thing about A Dance with Dragons and A Feast for Crows is that George is clearly writing for screen and almost none of it is used, like John Con intro, Aegon, to the Golden Company. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, like, you know, there's definitely some, some changes um, in writing style as you go on where, where, where the show is clearly influencing George, like Tyrion becomes more of a jokester in a, in, in a dance with dragons and has more quips than he does, than, than he does like early on. And it, it, it's clear to, you know, to kind of, kind of match the show a little bit. Um, there's definitely some like, you know, moments I'm trying to think about like with like, um, yeah, where like Aegon is, is um getting you know getting revealed and things like this 
Though, you know, George is heavily influenced by his time in Hollywood and, like, his pacing. Like, you know, George is writing before going to Hollywood. So, so at some point, you guys have probably heard me talk about this a million times, but, like, George R. Martin has his, his 1970s period, which is, like, mostly science fiction. And then he starts writing novels at the beginning of the 80s. And th- there's a little shift in the 80s because he starts writing a little bit of fantasy. And he writes, his, he writes some novels. He starts with Dying of the Light, which is, which is smaller. Then he does, he does Fever Dream. And then he, he writes Armageddon Rag, and Armageddon Rag bombs. And he, he, he kind of sees it at the end of his writing career, or at least his novel writing career. So then he goes to Hollywood. And he writes for Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, uh, shows like this. Um, and then he writes on a show called Beauty and the Beast for three seasons. And that experience changed his writing into, into he thinks more about like pacing and having like big reveals and, and um, the dialogue, his dialogue be- became better. Um, quippier uh more fun to read um and so uh so what you know when he comes when he gets to the point where he's writing ice and fire like it's just uh there's a slightly different feel now now that there's a little bit of hollywood in there um and so you're i you know i do think you're right that that he goes back into that later but it it might you know it's just you know, about how scenes are played and the action and, and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's funny how, how different A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons are from A Game of Thrones. Just like these long, like why you need all of these long trips and him sitting describing atmosphere for a long time that he just didn't do in those early books and stuff like that. Hmm. Uh, Simpsons or Family Guy, which one do you like better? <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, generally speaking, I'm one to to think that like early Simpsons was very, was very very good, and like, um, and after that, it just kind of became forgettable. Family Guy, it's kind of the reverse, where like the early Family Guy had some like funny stuff that made me laugh, but like, it kind of got better as time got on went on. Like, um, Seth MacFarlane got a little darker. And, and, and uh, it was more than just like random references to, to Gary Coleman or whatever. Um, and there was some, some funny stuff. So I think I actually do like Family Guy more, but not for the reasons people think. Like, um, you know, like the Kool-Aid man running through a wall, which like in the original, like first season of Family Guy is super funny. Everybody's like, oh no, oh no, oh yeah. And then the Family Guy, uh, Kool-Aid man breaks through the through the wall i thought that was so funny and so random but the, the humor changed to just be kind of like weirder and darker and and uh more political and and uh more about life in general and and uh i do think it got better well the simpsons just kind of started out as a very serious commentary and critique of american culture and then just descended into nothing i don't know even know what it is now uh, it's you know so I, I definitely Family Guy I think is somehow wins in the end you know um as somebody who uses a pseudonym I get the privacy online I met more would you have editors on a future stream maybe to talk about a chapter yeah yeah we could, that's certainly a possibility you know um you know anybody that wants to you know, I'm pretty open to people that want to be on the stream. Um, uh, you know, just a lot of people are busy, you know, but like whenever, like, for, first of all, like, like certain people have like open, um, they just have the, the address to call in. So like Carmine, Trey, the explainer, Glytus, fill the issues guy, they can call in at any time. And I just pick up, <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, there's different people that I've had, and you know, I have different people on. But yeah, I could definitely have a on, on an editor and and uh, and talk about things, talk about um, 
how, how they thought things went. Cause uh, certainly like my opinion on what I thought was good and how I think it evolved, like a chapter evolved might be different for somebody else's. We're like, no, I, I really thought things were going well. And then, and then Preston changed something and it went, went horrible. <laughs> um, do how Stark's words have a deeper meaning? I don't think originally. So how Stark's words come from, a story called and seven times never kill man which a character just kind of says winter is coming which kind of means like let's prepare let's not go to war let's stop let's like in the story there are these these uh this these, these religious zealots called the steel angels um and the, they land on this planet filled with essentially the children of the forest they're called they're called the uh the jane she and the Jane she um, you know, they're, they're these like Wookiee like creatures that, that live in the forest that, uh, that worship these pyramids, these black pyramids and the steel angels are religious fanatics and they, they, they worship back along the pale child, which you may, which you may know from the, the house of black and white. And, you know, they're, they're at some point, they start like attack, you know, attacking and killing more and more of these like Jane Shi and spreading out. And this arms dealer starts like selling weapons to the Jane Shi and and so that they can fight back because he doesn't like what the Steel Angels are doing. And and at one point, one of the guys is like recommending to the leader of the Steel Angels, like, hey, you know, maybe we should chill on this whole like fight thing. Uh, winter is coming. Let's just worry about getting our harvest and and we're, we're going to be okay. And the leader is like, no, we, we need to pursue this this religious war. And he's, he's clearly getting visions at some point um, from these pyramids. You know, clearly the pyramids are like influencing his mind. And so the, they, you know, but he gets this like message, like winter is coming, like chill out, like prepare. Um, no, don't go to war. And then, so, but <clears throat> they do anyway, and they, they go and they, they destroy a pyramid, but then the pyramid weirdly has the pale child back on in the middle and it flips them out as this like sign from God. And so they bring it back, the pyramid back, and they put it in the middle of their, their, their fortress. And then they're told to like burn all of their food. Um, to prepare for like some wonderful bounty that's going to, that's going to come and to uh, sacrifice their children. So they, they kill all their children um, and hang them and burn all of their food um, at the end of the story. And uh, that's, that's kind of the end of things. <laughs> um, and you're like, Oh crap. <laughs> like, um, and so, uh, you know, the Steel Angels are clear influences of, like, the R'hllor religion. The Jane Shi are clear influences of, like, the, the the Children of the Forest. The Pyramids are clear influence of the Werewoods. You know, things like that. But but Winter is Coming was, like, you know, kind of this, um, this cry of, like, uh, no, dude, like, don't worry about war. Focus on feeding yourself. But it's funny that it's become this, like... Winter is coming. We got to fight the others. Winter is coming. Urgh. You know, even in the show, you know, the stupid um, Alina Tyrell woman who was just like constantly obsessed with people's house words. Like, ugh. Our, we're, we were bound to lose because because we're roses and, and, uh, and our house words are lame. That's the reason we've lost all of the wars. Like, <laughs> if only we had winter is coming, you know. Now, I think maybe later on you can kind of say, like, you know, if you put enough time into, into thought into it, maybe you could apply it to, like, oh, we've got to think about the others or whatever. But originally it was about, like, worry about food. Don't worry about fighting. Um, free will can't exist, but, Brill's, but Brand's will is stronger. I guess, but it's just, why is everything... Uh, um, why has everything happened the same way in a loop with, with, uh, with free will? Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think, 
I mean, George R. R. Martin has always written these stories about people people coming in and and using their their telepathic powers to like influence thought and influence people's decisions. Um, I'm stuck between Ed and Satin. Who do you think will be the 999th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch? I definitely think this is a a um, a red herring, the number thing, with regards to like uh, the Lord Commander thing, because um, it's so silly, right? Like it's so silly that we're sitting there going, "Oh my gosh, John is totally going to come back as the one thousandth leader of the Night's Watch," and that's like some significant like number. Like, why would it be significant? Like, why on earth would it be significant? Like, logically speaking, like, what god or what time travel mechanism or whatever would try to make like um, the thousandth Lord Commander an important thing? Um, it's like the 300th year and, and the religious zealots like coming at the 300th year and it being, a, I totally think that it's going to be nothing. Uh, whoever is the thousandth. Um, and that I don't even think it's going to be John. So, but uh, who's going to be, who's going to be uh, Ed, and, Ed or Satin? Well, I mean, they're supposed to have an election. It'd be really sad if they didn't have an election. Right. It's just, um, uh, that's a fun scene that's be taken away, because the think about how much fun the original election was. It would be great to go back and have another one, you know. Um, could I could I see Satin winning or Ed winning? I don't know. I mean, both were like Ed was not very popular uh, on the on the one round. Um. So, I mean, if you had an election, it all depends on who wins the war. Would Bowen Marsh or or uh, um, Arwick, uh, your, 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 your youthful, youthful, youthful Arwick? <laughs> um, I'm pretty, uh, let's see. Youthful, how, 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 we've got to, we got to pronounce it correctly. Um. Awful Yarwick, awful Yarwick. I mean, they're they're going to be more popular, but I don't. I mean, Ed, would they really elect Satin? I mean, just realistically, right? This is we've established earlier that this is a this is a a, a world that hates gay people, um, and thinks them all pedophiles. And Ed, Ed might be more popular, but I don't know. I think anybody else. <laughs> I think probably Bowen Marshall or, 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 or Earthly Yarwick or, or, or somebody. LRD, maybe, maybe. Um, huh. Tyrion Lannister is heavily based on Miles Vorks again, a, a dwarf with two different eye colors and a big head. Tyrion is even based on his cousin Ivan, uh, and then they changed it to Miles. Well, here's the thing: is all dwarfs have big heads, so that's not that's not um, anything. But um, but um, Miles Vorkison, Vor, Vor, uh is the protagonist of a science fiction series called the Vorkison Saga. Um, so the problem with this is that, let's see here, 86. I mean, keep in mind that like George R. R. Martin did have another story with a, with a, with a dwarf, um, a, a chess playing alcoholic dwarf. I can't remember if his eyes were, he was noseless. He was a noseless um time traveling alcoholic chess playing dwarf um who would have quips who who had a broken heart so i mean it's largely based on on under siege which is uh the story a story by george r martin but to place in this other dwarf with a um eye, eyes uh different eye color changes well, I mean, this this uh, 
the series did win a Hugo, which means George is totally, it's totally on George's like, um, radar. So that, that, that fits. Um, let me see about miles. Where is this mile? Does he really have two colors eyes? One brown. <clears throat> oh, I'll have to see about. Let's see here. <clears throat> Miles Naismith uh, Vorkosigan, military officer, space mercenary. Um, uh, I don't know. Does he have two different color eyes? I, I I'm not sure if that's that's the uh, the situation, but. Let's say he does, but the, um, I mean, we also have, you know, so many other stories with, you know, little people. I mean, there's this idea that Tyrion is a dwarf and he uses a battle axe just like dwarves in, in, um, in Lord of the Rings. You know, you've got move, you've got very influential movies like Willow and stuff that George is going to like, maybe, maybe this as well, you know, this, this miles, this miles character, he, and he has his story under siege, which already kind of existed. Um, now under siege, this story, did this story come before this? My story might've come before, um, under siege, but, uh, I'm trying to think when the, when these, when these books came out, whether or not it's published in 86 under siege i think was around the same time um this one might might, might win um under siege 80 ah well uh under siege was published in 85 so actually, Under Siege comes out a year before the Varko Sigan saga, saga. So I mean, all these things, you know, might influence to some degree. But George did have a dwarf story already. Um, Preston is very lonely. <laughs> um, it's like sort of like raised by wolves. There does seem to be a lot of these stories about like nature influencing people and sending dreams dreams and, and and stuff like that um so like raised by wolves like definitely had a very george r martin kind of feel that like the whole planet was one organism that was like sending dreams to people and influencing them to be crazy uh is it still possible to help with the fanfic project yeah every time every time there's a uh we need a chapter i accept uh like we we except submissions and then you know you take bits and pieces from all the submissions and we kind of like merge them together and then and then edit and put stuff together so uh it's yeah of course it's open everybody like you know writes and and um lots of lots of great ideas come together like without the collaborative ideas of everybody else they they wouldn't be that the chapters wouldn't be as as good um it's just uh that's the the nice thing um <clears throat> let's see in the telltale game uh show like intro the sun has a hexagonal shape structure around it maybe george r martin told them about a sci-fi plot the show gave up on huh um yeah i don't know i don't know about about the uh about this hexagon hexagon sun Telltale game, and then you you know you never know about like how much George is even part of these things because he's he's so busy all the time. Um, this idea that like, what if, what if the structure of the Ice and Fire universe is actually like not planet around sun, but actually more of a of a of a flat Earth kind of kind of uh, existence with like actual like physical bodies floating around. Which um, some people wonder wonder about. Um, it's it's possible. Who knows? Who knows? Bonifer Hasty is Rhaegar's father. Um, that 
that'll be something. Let's look at the um, let's look at the let's look at the timeline on that. Um, the Bonifer Hasty thing is just kind of like shoved in there pretty late, right? Um, because like this the the backs I want to say when was the back was the backstory established in with Barristan or did they actually have it before? Um, yeah, it's weird that they just shoved that he was established as this character and then they just shoved in this backstory for him. Um, <clears throat> according to Barristan Selmy, he once wore the princess's favor at attorney when she defeated all challengers to make her the queen of love and beauty. <clears throat> Their love was ultimately a brief thing and could never be otherwise. Bonifer was too low birth to, to be considered a suitor for the princess. Oh, so yeah, there's totally time for him to um, to uh, to impregnate her, considering that this love and beauty thing was before uh, before she even got married. Though I do think it plays into this like weird. There's this weird idea that like who you select at, as at, at attorney um, has any like influence on like romance. Um, it's such an odd thing, right? Like that, that we assume like, like, you know, with, with, with fire and blood, it's really ridiculous. Like, oh my gosh, like Rhaenyra and Kirsten Cole must be banging because she was, because he was always her, her, um, she, he always got the favor at the tourneys. And even though I do kind of think they were banging like l later on, it's, it's just so silly. Like, why, who cares? <laughs> like, who cares? He, he got a favor at attorney, but then we it, like turns it in. It like turns around so often in the story, like Jorah marrying Lanes, um, like Rhaegar and, and Lyanna supposedly like having a romance. Um, you know, this idea that like, oh, this love between Bonifer Hasty and Rayla because he, he wore her tourney and he crowned her love and like love and beauty at a, at a tourney. It's such a silly, it's such a silly idea. And George must know it's a silly idea. And one of these situations, there must be something wrong with it. Like that there was no love. Like, yeah, I gave the guy a favor at a tourney. Who cares? Like, it's not that big a deal. Um, he must eventually like pull the rug on like out from under us on like such a stupid concept, right? Like that the whole world believes that like every time a woman gives a, a favor to somebody and a jousting tilt, like that then somehow like means that there's like true love between them or that they're having sex. Like, Oh, Rhaenyra gave a, gave a garter to, to, to Harwin, I guess they're having sex. Like, it, I guess Rayla and Bonifer Hasty had this like deep love affair. You know, at some point, we, we it's got to be exposed. Like, I'm not saying that these particular you know instances are the are the ones, but at some point, it's got to be just like a big joke. Like, what are you an idiot? <laughs> are you an idiot? Like, <laughs> but. It's just such a such an odd thing that's got to be called out eventually. Is there any reason why Ned told Cat to task Galbert Glover and Helmut Talhart to gather men? Why those two specific houses, the only two non-lordly northern houses, uh, masterly houses, landed knights? Huh. Um... Uh, I mean... Let's see, think about this. Um, so first, I've got to, I'm got to find the uh, the point in which he he, he talks about this, because you know Ned is closer to the Glovers. I mean, I, this is going on the assumption that that um, that the the people that Ned brought to the Tower of Joy are like his closest allies. Um, Okay. When the door was closed, Ned turned back to his wife. Once you're at home, send word to Helmand Tallhart and Galbert. This is from Eddard Four. So, this is after the point in which Catelyn comes down to King's Landing after um, 
discovering the the um uh, she fe- she feels the need to go after the the cat's blood dagger situation and how things are dire once you're home send word to, to helman talhart to, to helman talhart and galbert glover under my seal they are to raise a hundred bowmen each to fortify moat Kalen. 200 determined archers can hold the neck against an army instruct instruct lord manderley that he has to strengthen and repair all the defenses of white harbor and see that they are well manned and from this day on i want to carefully watch like uh, want careful watch over theon Greyjoy. if there is war we shall have sore need of his father's fleet so So clearly in this situation, he seems to trust Manderley, Tallhart, and Glover more than the others. Um, I mean, looking at, if it were just Tallhart, and we've got to pull up a map of the north. If we're just Tallhart, I would be like, oh, it's, it's, it's a location thing. You know, like, Torrance Square, you know, is fairly near the neck. Sending sending people down isn't that, isn't you know isn't that big of a deal for him, so <clears throat> so there's Torrance Square. Yeah, you could send people from Barrington, but he might understand that there's he might get a sense that Lady Dustin doesn't like him. You know, like he must get a sense that dust that Lady Dustin doesn't like him because he didn't bring back her her husband's bones and she's pissed. You know, and maybe he knows that. So okay, let's just let's. Let's keep Lady Dustin out of here. So let's get a um, hundred men from from Torrance Square to go down. But why Galbert Glover at Deepwood Mott? Like, why not Castle Serwin? Like, that seems quicker and easier to get a hundred archers. Why not White Harbor, who has many more men? Like, why not just task Manderley to do the whole fucking thing himself? Um, he's the closest to Moe Kalen. Like, get a hundred fucking archers. Why are you getting people from Deepwood Mott? Um, that seems silly to me. <sighs> and that's the thing. I mean, he does, he does want Manderley to do stuff. So it's not just Galbert Glover and, and Tallheart, but it's like to pull the... to defend Moat Kalen. Yeah... I don't know. It's just so so odd that he just wouldn't ask. Maybe he just wants to, you know, get everybody on board. But it's it must be that he he you know if I'm if I'm to guess if I'm to guess here that it's a it's a somewhat of a function of of lo- of like location and loyalty. Like maybe he feels the Umbers are super loyal, but they're pretty far. Maybe he feels that the the that uh, the Dustins are close, but you know he's got he's in a bad situation with them, so he just pulls he pulls you know Galbert Glover, Tallhart, and and uh, and Manderley to to tasking them um, to do stuff, but um, but you know I don't think it has to do with the the landed knight like lord thing because he's tasking Manderley at the same time, but. I think maybe it's a function of like who's closest and who would have the men and and you know who does he trust the most. Though it's weird that he wouldn't bring you know Serwin Castle Serwin people down or whatever. Yeah. Um Rhaegar is tall like Bonifer. Rayla does seem to have an aff- does seem to have had an affair and Ares does have trouble conceiving i don't know i've always thought it fit it could i mean i think i think it's one of those um one of those gardening seeds that george r R. martin planted that he might he might put in later um but uh but it 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 rings so similar to Kristen cole and and rhaenyra right or or you know if you if you'd like harwin strong and 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 rhaenyra um, you know, this like knight that's, uh, that's secretly having sex with, with, with royalty, with the queen or whatever. Um, you know, how does Bonifer Hasty get close to her is a real question. Like, 
you know, like women at court, it's really tough to to get them alone. This is why I think all of these like stories um, about uh, about people having affairs is is, is is difficult. I actually don't even know how. Well, I'm trying to think of like. So Cersei, she gets away with her affair with with um, Jamie and with Lancel because they're family. So no one's ever questioning like them going in to see the queen. You know, oh, it's perfectly fine that Lancel's going in to see the queen. The King's Guard aren't going to say anything. Plus, they're pretty loyal. Um, and then she starts like banging Kingsguard themselves, or or at least the brothers of Kingsguard. You know, like you know, we're not really sure which kettle blacks she bangs and which kettle blacks she doesn't. Um, she admits to all of it, even though she might have not actually been been banging Osmond. I think she she definitely bangs Os um, Osfried, right? I'm gonna confuse them all, but um. On, on which ones which ones she um she she bangs she definitely bangs osney yes she definitely bangs osney kettle black we don't know if she bangs osfried or osmond um though she admits to it even though uh there's no, uh, there's no, there's no real proof of, of that. But you know, the brother is is a king's guard, so he might keep the secret of, of, of her of her banging him. But like, how did how would Bo, how that's the question I would have is how did Bo, how would Boniface Hasty ever see the queen alone to have sex with her? Um, all right, at this point, she's she's uh, she's princess, right? When when they when they, when he makes her love and beauty, um, not many know of Bonifer's brief relationship with the queen in their youth. Jamie knows that something had happened um, that make him stop jousting and decided to become religious, but it's like. I just don't know how how they're getting in to do the nasty and like where they're doing the nasty. Um, yeah, she's praying in the God's wood. <laughs> He's going out there. I don't know. <laughs> um, press it, everyone in chat. Do you think that Ashara? Uh, what do you think about Ashara being Arthur? Um, what do you think about Ashara being Arthur Dane? Has it, has anyone ever seen Arthur without his helmet on? <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is, is that she, I think Ashara dances with Arthur at the wedding, um, at the Harrenhal tourney. So I think they've actually been seen together. Um, so I'm just, for, for it to actually happen, let me bring up the quote from Bran. Um, it might just say she danced with a white knight. So it says the Kranig men saw the, uh, the maid with purple, with laughing purple eyes, dance with a white sword, a red snake, and the Lord of Griffins. And lastly, with the quiet wolf, but only after the wild wolf spoke on her behalf. behalf. So maybe she didn't sleep, uh, dance with her brother. Um, but it'd be di very difficult when she was, I think she was acting as, as handmaid for for uh, Rayla for a while, um, you know, how, would she be able to moonlight as as a um, as a member of the Kingsguard at the same time? Like, I understand that Varys is uh, is able to somehow like maintain a, a full time job as Master of Whispers and a full time job in in the Black Cells, um, but uh, I don't I don't know if Ashara could 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 fill both of those positions at the same time that'd be a tough one that'd be a tough one i'm gonna i'm gonna vote against it <laughs> thank you josh thank you um how did they tear down the tower of joy 
So recently, you know, I made this. I've been, I've been stumped on this one for a while. That isn't it really weird that the two men destroyed a, a tower, and then I had someone who who worked as a mason um, come in and say uh, uh, and um, uh, post a message saying, you know, it's actually relatively easy to tear down a tower at, 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 and like brick by brick. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, you just two dudes start at the top and they just like start knocking out stones and you know you start at the top and you just go do, 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 all the way down um you know it might it's it's tough work it might take you a day but it's it's like not actually difficult to destroy uh a wall um which really which really quite surprised me um but even even saying like okay maybe it, maybe it took him a few days but like a small little little castle or, or tower could two guys just do it yeah i guess um my original theory on that was they brought down the tower by like burning it down with like wildfire that that you know in my head canon that if Rhaegar is nuts and prophecy oriented like every other targaryen he must be thinking about birthing dragons like every other freaking targaryen and therefore like Maybe he had a bunch of eggs at the Tower of Joy and there was wildfire and he was going to start it on fire or something crazy like that. And they just like wildfired the and that that Cersei bringing down the Hands Tower was kind of a literary parallel to this. And so that Cersei starting the Hands Tower on fire and having it collapse was was similar to, to Ray, what Rhaegar was going to do. And Ned shows up and he fi- sees all this wildfire and eggs and it's like, fuck. Let's let's destroy this thing and burn it down. That's the thing is Ned had to feel like there was a reason to to tear it down. I mean, I understand like, oh yeah, my sister died and I'm really pissed off. Let's 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 destroy this tower because my sister died. You know, I, I, I that's a weird motivation. You know, like I understand that like okay, like that kind of stuff exists, but you know, like um where people do weird stuff like that, but it's not, there's not, it's not really a firm motivation on like sister died in a tower. I need to destroy that tower. Okay. Uh, you know, like brand fell from a tower. Did they destroy that tower? You know, like did, uh, um, there, there's no need, right? <laughs> like painful memories. Do you have to painful memory to like someplace I'm never going to visit again? Like I'm never going to visit the princess pass again. Is it important that I destroy a tower there? It, so like, that's why I thought like them burning it down to destroy all these eggs, these dragon eggs or whatever. And this wildfire was like a good motivation. So, I mean, so at the end of the day, like it's possible that two dudes just decided to destroy a tower. You get in the top, you start pushing off rocks, you start knocking off rocks, and you get you you know it takes you a couple days, but you you do it. But then you don't really have a reason, like why are you doing that? So the reason being like, you know, the the wildfire prophecy thing in my head was like, there's no there's not very much evidence of it other than that other Targaryens were crazy, but um, you know, I, I thought wildfire and the, the the parallel to Cersei, but I thought wildfire would be a cool way to cool way to bring down the tower. <clears throat> is that my kids I'm hearing or Preston's? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I know. My 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 son is my son's a loud one. He's really really loud. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> brand, brand can affect causation and still not symbolize free will, still be determined as well. I can't, uh, I can stop objects in motion, but not, may not be acting freely. Um, oh, brand can affect causation and still not symbolize free will, still be determined as well. I can stop objects in motion, but not be acting freely. Um, I think getting back to this like free will issue is that um, I think there's there's like a I think there's an idea about like free will may not exist, but if we don't know the mechanisms behind everything and and, and everything is not planned out and visualized, 
it's as if free will is there. And so like if brand brand knows the entire world and knows all of the causation in the past and is able to manipulate things and therefore there's no free will, but you create, but by destroying the whole system, it's all shrouded again in mystery and therefore free will like arises because we don't really know what's causing something anymore, you know, something like that. And I think it somewhat relates to like God as well. Like, you know, for religious people, there is a set path for the universe, which is eventually there's going to be Armageddon and Jesus is going to return. And all of these things are foretold, making everything else pointless. Mankind is not responsible for his own actions. Like, you know, mankind's future is, 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 and, and how it directs itself is, is useless and pointless because it's all part of God's plan. But if you destroy all that, you destroy religion and God is just, and man is just by himself and he he just he determines his own destiny <clears throat> i think that might be part of it too i you know i think there there's something relating to time travel and god and predestination and that the only way to actually truly have free will um is to destroy all of that and to remove religion and uh from from the picture so something like that um I think I said it a little more clearly in my in ty- my, my time traveling brand video, but uh, I I do think there's something to to deal with that. I'm not saying that George R. R. Martin is even very clear with his with his like philosophical beliefs. He's not. I don't think philosophy in general can't be clear. And when we're talking about free will versus predestination, we're never going to come to an answer because you know thousands of philosophers have looked at this issue. And have and have and cannot cannot come to a resolution. So like I don't think George R. Martin is gonna do it either, or or us. But I think it's something to do with the idea is something to do with that. We have to destroy all of this to really and and make it a mystery again in order to in order to have free will. A little bit of when morning comes mist fall on that. Oh, uh, thank you, Griffin. Um Um <laughs> Woohoo, we're going to the hot springs. Well, you have a good time. The uh Taiwanese, they love to go to hot springs. Um it's uh it's uh it's a 4-day weekend here in in, in Taiwan because of something called RR Ba. Um uh so RR Ba when when the um so the Japanese owned Japanese ruled Taiwan before Taiwan kind of had its own, I don't know, pseudo pseudo independence, but Republic of China kind of situation. So, so Japan was ruling the island until 1945, and then uh, after after you know the war, the the island was handed over to the Republic of China, but the Republic of China was in the middle of a civil war, so they couldn't really. Um, uh, um, ad- administer the island effectively. So they handed it off to this governor. Um, uh, Pu Yi, was that his name? Um, he is just, he's, he's, this guy has just gone down in history as um, Chun Yi. Um, so this provincial governor, Chun Yi, is handed Taiwan for, the period, for a period between 1945 and 1949. Because 1949, the war, the Civil War ends, and the, the the nationalists all flee to Taiwan. So for this four-year period, um, the Japanese leave, and this and this provincial governor Chun Yi like gets takes over the island, and the Taiwanese are kind of wanting independence and 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 self-rule. So there's some protests, and uh, he he ends up just slaughtering a whole bunch of people uh, in this protest, um, and so. I mean, you're talking like, I'm talking like 20,000 people, 25,000 people were like killed in these protests, like enormous number of people. Like you're talking like when we think of like Tiananmen, like everyone remembers Tiananmen, a thousand people died at Tiananmen tops. This is like 20, 25 times bigger than Tiananmen. But no one knows about like, other than Taiwanese people, no one knows about the, the RR Ba incident. Um, but it just goes to show like, like the Taiwanese were not 
we're not cool with like you know uh, Chinese rule um, from pretty much from the get go. So you know they remember this as like, and this is a big kind of moment in Taiwanese identity as like like that there was always this independence like feeling inside them, um, and so this Chun Yi guy like went down in history as a monster. Um, and so, uh, anyway, the, the, the nationalists came in with, with, with Chiang Kai-shek and, um, you know, the Taiwanese have very mixed feelings about Chiang Kai-shek. He's not so loved anymore and, and things like that. But, but the, uh, anyway, we've got this four day weekend because it's 228 on Tuesday. And so everybody in Taiwan goes on vacation at the same time. I mean, everything's completely crowded so like everybody, like everybody's going to be going to like hot springs but they're going to be so crowded to this weekend anyway um hallis mollen alive dead lost hallis mollen has got to be alive he's got to come back into the story they wouldn't have brought him they wouldn't have brought him up in a dance with dragons if if uh if if he were if he were not gonna come back like they could have just like forgotten about ned's bones and never brought it up again but they brought him up hallis mollen is like totally alive totally coming um we just got to figure out how to fit him in fit him in um so he's gonna appear in the fanfic um thoughts about jamie's dream uh under casterly rock yes jamie's dream under casterly rock is about it's kind you know there's a lot to do with like chains and like brianne and him like giving her a sword a lot it's on a on a micro level it has to do with jamie empowering Brienne, but I think on a macro level, it has to do with like men empowering women. Like it, it has to do with like, um, you know, if you don't give women the tools that they need to, uh, I don't know, like f- fend for themselves in this world, like uh, whether that be education or in this world, they're, they're, he's claiming like, you know military like fighting fighting sense like giving her a sword like giving her power um you know giving her the metaphorical you know penis uh to to not giving it to her but like giving her one giving her the the power in this world i you know i think it has a lot to do with that like she's chained and doesn't have like agency and he needs to like give her agency um and i i think that's more about like what it what it means uh like in, in both a micro sense and a macro sense, it's it's about like empowering, empowering Brienne. I understand that there's some other stuff about, um, and I might be conflating because if Jamie had more than one vision, but um, some stuff about like the Kingsguard telling him that that he's uh, that he is um, that he betrayed his oath and stuff like that, and he's supposed to be haunted by that, but but. Um, this gets into like the Brianne Jamie story is about like free will and, and choosing your own moral direction and, and moral code. You can't just phone it in and, and say you're going to follow a King or, or, or follow a religious code or whatever. You're not putting any thought into that. You're not doing, there's no morality to that. You're just, there's no morality to duty is what George R. Martin's kind of saying. And so there, there's a lot of like, you know, internal conflict in Jamie's brain uh, until he come to, kind of comes to this idea of like, what's his code? You know, what does Jamie really believe in? Um, you know, it's probably about, it's probably something simple like helping people, you know, and helping say, you know, saving Sansa and helping Brienne and which, you know, has more about, you know, about like, I don't know. I do think it's about empowerment. Um, but, you know, George R. Martin is a huge, huge feminist from the, from the 70s, and these are the kind of issues he thinks about. And they're very, very relevant to the Jamie Brienne story, among, you know, above all. But um, how, how much does... I can go and visit that. Um, if that... How long that thing is. Hold on a second. A lot of people like look into, they read into some other things like, is there something under Casterly Rock? What's under Casterly Rock? I don't know if there's much like in a physical sense, is there really something under Casterly Rock or does Casterly Rock represent like all of the tradition 
of like male dominated machismo society that he would that that of that's like weighing on him or something like that um huh I just does he have he has that in storm let me see here da, 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 da. Hello, hello. How are you? Carmine? What is undercast for Lee Rock? What is going on? What, what, what is? The Democrats don't want you to know. But some, you never answered is... my super chat, by the way. You had a super chat? Yeah, uh, I'll just tell you here. Um, the super chat is, uh, what are your thoughts on Trump uh, not bringing uh, the barbecue sauce to with the Big Macs to East Palestine? He didn't bring barbecue sauce to and Big Macs to East Palestine. Yeah, he brought Trump water, uh, Big Macs, but he didn't bring barbecue sauce, which really would have made the meal. They put what if the, I mean you're you're thinking the barbecue sauce should go on a Big Mac. I mean, I, I dip mine in like if, if if I get it every every now and then they'll slip up and you know throw some in there. I put it in there. But it already has Thousand Island dressing on it. That's not Thousand Island dressing. Yeah, you don't you don't think special sauce is Thousand Island dressing? It's special sauce. Like I, every asshole loves to say, "Bro, it's just Thousand Island dressing." No, it is not. That special sauce is something different. They put something else in there. I don't know what it is. I don't know what they got in there. It's it's, it's something else. I, I I see. I see. Um. Well, you know, whatever, whatever. His fault. I guess you should go and apologize to everyone for for with Big Macs. Uh what is, what is under Castle Rock? Uh, it, it's, I, you know, some people think there's like some sort of weird monster, or something more physical or something, but I, I, I do think it's just like, it just represents like the 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 chains of like the traditional society or something. Um, but Tyrion used to go down there too and like read stories and weird stuff and stare into flames like a, like a crazy person. Um. What's been going on, Carmine? Oh, what, what's uh, been happening? Nothing. I was just, just, just uh, I was, I was eating some chicken noodle soup. By the way, there's an echo. You might want to put on some uh, earbuds. I was trying to get Trey on. By the way, he 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 has like a debate. He wants to go down with you. He uh, what is it? Hold on, let's see what it is. But no, you should put on some uh, earbuds so it doesn't echo if you can. Um. Okay, is it is it is it your is it you is it you echoing? Is it? Yeah, it's me echoing through you because I'm coming. Oh, through your, it's uh, you! Speech. It's you going into my mic. All right, all right. Yes, look, yes. look, fine, fine. You know what? Fine. <laughs> fine, fine. But no, Trey. I asked Trey if he could come on, but he's busy with something else. Um, but he goes, uh, "Tell Preston that I wasted an ungodly amount of time there, trying there. trying to figure out when." Is that, is that better? Is that better? You, ha you you happy that I got my got my beats on? <laughs> let, let let me get you some headphones like those cat ears. But no, uh, Trey has spent an ungodly amount of time um, trying to figure out whether Lamas Longstrider existed in Ice and Fire, and he's narrowed it down. So he wants to uh, he wants to he wants to bring it. He wants to come on, and uh, I'm trying to get him on, but I think he's I guess he's busy right now. Uh, well, he's finishing up school, right? He, he finished it no, up. He's done. he's done. And then he, he's been, I mean, he's, he, he rides a lot of horses and he tweets a lot. So that takes up like 90% of his time. <laughs> he was telling me, he was telling me, he goes, yeah, I got to start uh, uploading more videos. It's just, uh, I don't know. I just got to start uploading more videos now that I'm living by myself. I'm like, yeah, man, you gotta, you gotta get on that. And of course, you know me. Getting to talks of Patreon and all that other stuff. You know me. Mm, 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 mm. Trying to get my man some cash. By the way, I did watch The Last of Us. Eh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, okay. Eh. Well, okay. I don't know all if right. it's eh because I played the DLC. And the fact that they went out of their way to make the DLC to this one little thing a whole episode. It's like they're trying to stretch out a 20-minute story to 60 minutes. Wasn't a fan of the episode. Okay, okay. Huh. Huh. Okay. I just, I don't know. I feel like there's, there's so many opportunities. Like there's so much stuff to add 
like on your on your own like that you don't even need to follow the story of the video game there's so much you can have in the world but um you know to add content if you want but i don't know we'll see we'll see we'll talk we'll talk i haven't watched it yet it was obviously like competing with this stream but um you know we'll see how it goes did you get my message about making it one giant smorgasbord yeah yeah, yeah. well i will do we'll do that we'll do that carmine and i uh, recorded a uh, review of of episodes four, five, and six of 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 um of the Last of Us, but uh, Carmine's always late on give on, on giving me. Uh, I, I, would you stop telling people this? Oh my god! <laughs> so we're gonna combine. We're gonna do. We're gonna do episode seven and then combine them together. Um, have you looked into Elden Ring at all? It's another post-apocalyptic sci-fi masquerading as fantasy, classic George. Yeah, I mean, so George apparently did... He apparently came in at a very early point in the video game um, and, like, gave him some world-building ideas. And so it was some classic George shit, you know, human souls and trees and stuff. Um, and, and, And then he forgot about it. You know, he's like, oh, and then this Elden Ring game game came out, and I totally forgot what I told him. I was like, oh, well, it sounds it sounds like you just told him about some some trees and shit. I've looked into it some, um, but uh, you know, I'd, I would have to do like a more. And I understand that a lot of people there there are a lot of videos uh, out now with like lore and stuff on Elden Ring, but um, I'd have to like uh, I'd have to go into it pr- uh, a bit on 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 the parallels. Like I don't think like I, I it does sound just like a lot of more of like souls and trees and and hive minds and shit like that. So we'll see we'll see like how many. Uh, so someone uh was asking on your subreddit. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Preston does have his own private subreddit that he's not a part of. You're not a mod on there. It's uh, the Sweet Robin subreddit. And so one of the it's most a, latest. It's not, really, it's not really my private. It's more like a a a a. a, a subreddit about it's about me, you but... it's, it's dedicated to you yeah and this guy goes hasn't preston been mysteriously quiet about elden ring what's what is going on he loves to dive into thousand worlds and tough voyagers but he can't give us a breakdown for the game of the year and mm. uh I, this, this is something i say to everybody like the guy's got like two kids and he's got to topple south american governments he's a busy guy so yeah, it's, it's it's been it's been pretty tough it's been pretty tough uh um the uh children 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 in time you know what what i can do what i can manage i would stre- stretch pretty thin on on what i uh um thoughts i thoughts on ben giver is he a potential pm um oh we're talking we're talking israeli politics here um <laughs> my my general uh my general feeling about Israeli politics is that if you're going to pick like the worst, um, the worst outcome, uh, it's probably going to be the outcome that happens. So, um, you know, you just feel like Netanyahu is just going to keep ruling, um, forever because it's just like the worst possible outcome that could possibly happen. You know, it's, uh, um, let's see what what are what are Ben Giver's uh, beliefs here. He's part of the religious Zionist party and now part of Atma Yehuda. Um, these oh these are the ultra orthodox. Oh how 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 well see now that you've said now that I I see who he is I'm like this would be a really horrible outcome and uh yeah that's uh, <laughs> it's like one of the, if i could pick like the worst one of the worst things to happen yeah it it seems it seems like him becoming pm uh might might um might be it jesus oh man um He once he once stated about clashes in East in East Jerusalem among Palestinians, "We're the landlords here. Remember that. I'm your landlord." Uh. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now keep in mind that these like far right guys, like their 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 full belief is that the West Bank. The, the true name of the West Bank is 
Samarita and Judea, and that it's a uh, it's a part of Israel, and that Palestinians have a country. It's called Jordan, and they should all go there. Um, that's that's fundamentally what they believe, um, and so it's you know you're not really going to get any like good situation for the for for I don't know human rights for the Palestinians or, or long-term peace or anything like that. It's, um, uh, it's, you know, but, uh, so poor, poor, uh, poor Israel, poor, uh, poor Israeli people, poor Palestinians. You just completely broken political system. And, and, um, you know, I I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, when it is ever going to get better. It's going to get better when, when, when um, Israelis start electing better people, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, as like, you know, the only people that have kids, uh, the people that have kids in Israel, the ultra right wingers who have like 20 kids and, uh, and, you know, the intelligent Israelis have like one and then they just, uh, goes nowhere, goes nowhere. It's a sad situation. You just gotta feel sympathy for everybody, somewhat. And then I'm like, why don't you just fucking elect somebody better? <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I got a uh, question on thoughts on Matt Richter's music for the leftovers. Um, I um, I so my feeling about the music and the leftovers is it's very emotional, and it and it does um. I think it's good, though I wish they would have made more of it. I do feel like the music is very repetitive and you start hearing the same music over and over again. And it was a little, it was, it was a tad grating for me where I'm like, Oh God, that song again. Um, or we're playing, we're playing like, where is my mind again? Like I, I just wish he would have done more. It was excellent, excellent music. But I always felt like it was the same thing, um, and music is used a lot, and so it, you know it's kind of similar to like, like with Game of Thrones. I never, I, I didn't feel like the music was used repeatedly too much, and you know I never felt like it was, uh, it, it it got annoying that I was hearing the same song. Um, Carmine, you're more focused on the music in Game of Thrones than I am. Like, did you think? Mm. Did did you find it a little more a little grating like when they used themes again, um, or was it like were they used sparse enough that that you were okay with it? In regards to what, from like Game of Thrones to House of the Dragon? Uh, I'm talking about Game of Thrones. Like, but when by the time season, like for instance, I know that in season eight, people were really annoyed when Roberts, like. Uh, King procession music is played when Jon Snow arrives with Daenerys in in um, right in Winterfell, and there and everybody's like, "That's the Bar- that's the Baratheon march." What the what the hell are you doing? And like for me, it's like I didn't it didn't really register with me. I was just like, "Oh, you know, it's 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 music. It seems fitting. Like it connects me back to the beginning. We I haven't heard this this theme too much, but I'm sick of it." Um, did you did you ever get tired of certain mu- certain themes and music? No, uh, almost every single track from the original Game of Thrones by uh, what's, what's the man's name Ram Raman Djawadi, yeah. I think was a banger, and that was one of the very few times we ever heard Robert's procession theme coming through. Yeah, so, yeah, and they plus they don't they shift it up a little bit. So there's a bit of a, somewhat of a remix, so it's fine. I would say the the one I'd say the one exception is I somewhat got sick of the whole wondrous dragon theme that they would play a lot whenever Daenerys got on a dragon. That would be like Which my... one is that? Remind me again? <laughs> you know. <laughs> da, 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 da. Wondrous dragon. <laughs> so inspiring as I'm looking to the sky. I don't know. Oh, that one. <laughs> <sighs> um yeah, so, but I, that's my, so the, the music of the leftovers is really good, but I, I do think it's a little repetitive. So, um, so you know, it's the same theme a, a lot, a lot. 
Um, favorite philosopher and why? I mean, doesn't everyone just love Sartre the most? Um, last song that made you cry. Huh. That's a, that's a toughie. You have any songs that made you cry? Carmine? Songs that make uh, you cry. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, I will tell you the one Game of Thrones theme that I really like that always kind of gets me a little emotional. It's hmm. um, the one where I forgot the name of it, but it's the I think it's I'm sorry, Khaleesi. It's the hmm. one where Jorah, Tyrion are in the throne room with Danny, and Danny sends him away. And the moment she goes, escort Sojora outside the city, the one that plays on that one. I forgot the name of it, but that one's always, that gets me a little emotional. Hmm, hmm. Um, yeah, and then thoughts on the Wall Street Journal article about COVID starting in Wuhan, Wuhan lab. Thanks for all you do. Yeah, I mean, that's surprising. Like, it, certainly when you hear the, the lab theory, you know, way back, you kind of say, oh, the, um, that, uh, that sounds like a big conspiracy theory. And that seems very, very silly that, that we can, we can blame, you can blame some lab, um, versus it just like developing naturally in the, in the, um, in the world as most viruses do, you know, like evolving naturally over time. Um, so it was, you know, certainly surprising, you know, it's, and it's, and this isn't, this is like, you know, the U S government like now saying like, no, no, I, this may be, this may be, um, evidence of, uh, of, of this coming, coming from a lab, you know? So, um, so I mean, I, we still need to know more about this. Who knows what they were actually like doing. I don't necessarily think that there was, uh, um biological warfare or anything like that going on versus like you know trying to study something for for whatever vaccinations or or whatever whatever reasons um but you know it's a a lab leak thing you know um it's uh i mean i i tend not to think that things are 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 big conspiracies so in, in, in real life. I mean, you can find big conspiracies in writing, but like, um, you know, it's, cer it's certainly surprising, certainly surprising that, uh, that, um, that, you know, it actually would come from a lab. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's anything sort of intentional. Um, so, I mean, maybe wrong about that. I guess we'll find out. Uh, we'll find out more in the future. Um, who do you think Danny and Quaith really are? I think my theory is that Danny is 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 a nobody, maybe a dragon seed from Dragonstone, and um, and that some sort of like manipulation has been put in to try to hatch these eggs, and she's going to have the special genes to do it. Um, I meanwhile, like Quaith, I think Quaith is. Um, she's got to be part of some sort of conspiracy that like wants the dragons to hatch um, and, ha and has been pushing things in that direction now. So I, I do think that like from a time traveling brand sense that she, she is somebody that time traveling brand is, is influencing and, and a soldier and time traveling brands like army. Cause I definitely think that, you know, dragons are part of his, his time loop. And he's, you know, definitely trying to figure out how to, how to bring them about. Um, so we shall, we shall uh, see. And maybe there's something before that with the, with the children of the forest trying to manipulate that kind of stuff. But, um, but uh, you know, is Quaith going to be somebody like Ashara Dane or, or Shira Seastar? I don't even think Jor. I don't even think George knows. I almost called him Jora. I don't even think Jora knows. Um, <laughs> I think he like creates these mysteries and then it's like, well, if something comes along later, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have that happen. I mean, I think she's, she's definitely a tool of time traveling brand, but you know, is she actually a Chardin or Shira Sea Star or somebody like that? You know, uh, maybe, maybe if it fits into the story and it makes sense later on, but I don't, I don't necessarily think like 
George decided from the beginning. You know, I think he, he he's like, oh, there's this mysterious character. You know, it's kind of like the Thread Crow. Like the Thread Crow didn't start as anybody um, in particular, or or you know the you know, and then he kind of like shoved in Blood Raven, and then maybe it's time traveling Brown on top of that. But like he just kind of created this mysterious character, and then um, kind of added stuff later on who it might be. You know, so. Uh, this person here adds credence to what you're saying here. Uh, Mr. No, 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 no. He mm. uh, quotes, quote, remember who you are, what you were made to be. Made. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely think that Danny is a tool in the in the time loop. Um, the dragons, the dragons are necessary in, in, in some respect. Hey, little guy. Hi. Match them all right. He wants me to do a Rubik's Cube, which um, I can't do unless I, like, look up how to solve them. Hey, how, what, what, what you doing? Can you, can you, can you, can you make them all white? I can later. I can later on, little guy. <sighs> I can do it later on. What, what are you, what are you, what are you, what are you up to? Uh, um, I, I match one Synced, but I can't match the others. Oh no! Yeah. I want to sit on top of your head. On, on top of my head? Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> can I sit on? Can I sit on your shoulders? I don't know. There's a lot of things that you're gonna break in here, so <laughs> so no. Okay. Do you want to get your Spider-Man? Okay. Here's, here's the Spider-Man. Uh, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Okay. Come on, okay. Okay. Come on, here. Can you help me match this? Okay. <clears throat> um. Let's see. Huge fan of your work and happy to finally uh, catch you live. Do you think Brienne and Jamie romance will remain one-sided, unconsummated forever? Huh. Now, certainly in the um, uh, in the show, they, they, they of course, like, um, got together. Um, and what, would it be more painful for... The, 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 I think the idea is, like, what is the most painful thing? And I think, you know, the way things went in the show of like Brienne like finally losing her virginity to to this this man she loved and then him like leaving her um, is certainly very, very painful. And like had he like not had they not had a sexual relationship, it, it wouldn't it, it would have not been quite a a um, um, an emotional connection. So in the sense of like, I, I, with George, you kind of go, what's the most emotionally painful thing to happen? The most emotionally painful thing to happen is for Jamie to, to consummate that relationship and then leave her. Um, and so I think they probably will eventually have sex and it will be very painful for Brienne. And that's just how it goes, you know? Um, what are you thinking, Carmine? Do you think they're, 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 they're going to get together? Uh, I have no idea. Well, I have no idea what George will do, but I feel like you're probably going to do that. And um, <laughs> uh, I just, I just want to, uh, I just want to remind the audience that I don't know if it's a deleted scene or an idea they had. But for season eight, when Jamie leaves Brienne, he kind of, he's he's a major asshole to her, and I'm glad they cut it because remember he was going to say, "I don't love you. Nobody loves you. Nobody can love you," and he walks off, and that's the last hmm. thing he ever says to Brienne. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. I don't know if it was cut or if they shot it, but that's a thing. That's also really painful. Like, you know, like, <laughs> that's pretty painful. They almost like went back and they're like, oh, crap. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, not necessarily not George to, for, for Jamie to say that. Uh, you know, but um, so, I mean, I think that in George's mind, he wants them to get together. Um it's just, it's just so, and keep in mind, you know, he's, 
Brienne is not a she's not Gwendolyn Christie. She's she's not a she's not a tall beautiful woman. <laughs> you know, she's she's ugly. Oh. Brienne is ugly. Remember that, you know? And Jamie is beautiful. Beautiful. Much more beautiful than even though Nicholas uh uh say his name full name for me Carmine. Nicholas uh, Costa Walla. Costa Costa Wide Wide June, something like that. Yeah. Wide June. Even though he is a damn handsome man, Jamie's better looking. <laughs> so um you know, that that's the uh that's the uh what the and it's just gonna be such a such a weird bumping and grinding. Um yeah. Kind of funny though, you know. I was thinking about I was I was reading some some stuff while doing some videos, and I came across like the, the John and and um, Egret kind of stuff, and how like his descriptions of Egret are just are just there's nothing there's nothing attractive about her, which is I thought kind of funny because he eventually you know like falls for her, but he like every description is like, well, she's got a pug nose and her eyes are like really far apart and her teeth are all screwed up. And you're like, okay, there's nothing <laughs> like what, what's going on? Like she's not Rose Leslie, you know? Um, but then again, John is not attractive in the books either. So he's got a horse face. So, um, yeah, what you gotta do? What you gotta do? Um, ever consider doing a theory on Frank Herbert's Dune seven novel, um, not what, uh, Brian Herbert and, um, uh, Kevin Anderson did, but what Frank would have done thoughts on Dune in general. Um, my thoughts on Dune in general. Uh, I think that Frank Herbert put a lot of time into Dune and I think that his follow-up novels, like up until, um, uh god emperor of dune like i think he put a lot of like time into i think near the end he was writing the the novels faster and i think he he was he realized that this was his bread and butter and he was like pumping them out uh the stories get crazier they get more convoluted um there there's just less thought in 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 the the prose and things like that um some people are going to disagree with me but uh, I think like the last two novels, he's kind of writing, you know, kind of free and not really thinking about where things are going. Because I think he thinks he's got many novels to wrap it up. Like, I don't even know. Did Frank Herbert even think he was going to wrap it up in seven novels? Like, he was writing like a new novel. Like, I want to come say like the, um, like the years they came out and you can kind of figure out like... Um, like how much time he was putting into them. So Dune comes out in 1965. Dune Messiah, 1969. Children of Dune, 1976. God Emperor of Dune, 1981. So you're talking like there's a four-year gap, a seven-year gap, a five-year gap between, between his books. Then Heretics comes out three years after God Emperor, and Chapter House comes out one year after Heretics. Um, and so, you, you know, it's just, and I've looked at other series when, when I, when I see, see gaps like this. Like, you can take Dark Tower, for example, and like, the, you know, Stephen King writes the last three books in like a year and a half, and it freaking shows that he wrote the last three books in a year and a half when he like spent a lot of time and thought on the other ones. Um, and so I don't necessarily think there was like this big grand master plan at the end that 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 Frank Herbert knew about um, near the end of his his uh, his story. I think he was tacking stuff on. Um, making making Dune into a bigger universe and 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 adding more interesting weird things about 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 everything and um, and so uh, I mean I, I'm sure somebody said that the, he was planning on wrapping it up in seven but I don't know if I really believe that I think he he was just because uh, his death his death was rather unexpected um, Frank Herbert I want to say. 
he dies at age 65 and he um he um i'm trying to think like i want to say he got sick pretty quick um it says here He died of a massive pulmonary embolism while recovering from from surgery for pancreatic cancer um, in in uh, eighty six Madison Wisconsin. So it was it was even though he had this pa pancreatic cancer, he still um, the embolism kind of just happened, and um, so you can kind of like see see like like getting into Frank Herbert's head. Okay, so either like he knew he was like with the pancreatic cancer that he was that he was dying. You know, he probably wants like people get into these ideas of like, well, I need to set up my family and so I need to like pull the money in. And so he all start he starts writing like Dune to 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 get to get more money or he doesn't think he's dying at all and he thinks he's got plenty of time and Dune is just going to just keep going forever. At 65, there'd be no reason to, you know, for the guy to think that like he would want to wrap it up. Um so I don't you know, so I don't know if like the theories people have on like who are um so uh, one of the big mysteries at the end of Dune is is who are these two mysterious uh characters that they kind of um what what are their names? They have very modern names. Um They've like uh shoot, I'm totally like blanking on on um the uh the, um, you've never read Dune, uh, Carmine? Uh, not, I've, I've bits and pieces here and there. Uh, but I, uh, I listened to this, uh, one podcast on it. I can't Danny, Danny and enough. Marty. If you guys. Danny and Marty. So there's this big, like, so, so, Okay. For people that haven't read Dune, the, the 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 fundamental the fundamental like story of Dune is you've got this whole world is 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 ruled by this empire that that relies on spice. Paul Atreides like um, ends up like having a revolution on his, his house is backstabbed by another house. He, he gets a revolution on Dune, takes over Dune, gets control of all the spice, becomes the most powerful man in in the galaxy. Um, he then like uh kind of has a downfall and like becomes dark becomes kind of evil goes off into the into the into the desert his children kind of take over um he comes back there's some fighting his son decides he wants to become a worm his son because so then <laughs> yes so that's the first three books is is Paul's rise and fall is the first three books that's the that's that's dune um uh dune messiah and, and and children of dune the story picks up like a thousand years later and his son is still ruling as a worm um and people kind of decide like oh dude this this worm is completely corrupt we need to take this worm out and so duncan idaho like who's reincarnated like is trying to kill this worm and then you find out that no, actually the worm, like he actually had a big master plan about humanity and that he was a bastard because he's got this like big purpose for humanity coming. And so he, he, he ends up dying, the worm, and you we pick up again thousands of years later in like Heretics of Dune. And now like the galaxy is kind of ruled by the Bene Gesserits and, and this, these, this like this race of people are like coming in and invading, but they're fleeing something else. And we're not really sure what they're fleeing. And, you know, so there's two books that happen in this like third time period. And then things kind of end because we, we don't know what they're fleeing. And these, 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 um, you know, these mysterious characters, Danny and Frankie are appearing and we're not sure what, what, uh, what, what, what that's all about. So, 
Um, and so Brian Herbert, his son, and Kevin Anderson eventually like finished the series and they're like, oh, well, you know what they were running from? They were running from uh, machines and they want, you know, the God Emperor, like the worm, like wanted the, the, the end of humanity to be like some sort of balance between humanity and technology or something, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, the, 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 the wrap up has mixed reviews from people. Um, and so there's a lot of theor- theories that like, that couldn't have been like Frank Herbert's real ending. And I, I kind of agree. Like, I don't think Frank Herbert was, was, having even having interviewed Kevin Anderson myself, like I don't think Frank Herbert was really thinking that technology and a balance with technology was the end. Um, so I don't know what his, but I'm not sure he had his own idea. Like, so, you know, like Brian Herbert's idea, you know, is an idea. I'm not sure Frank Herbert had one, you know? So, um, you know, he was he he was writing fast. He had he had the cancer. He probably he either thought he had a lot of time to figure it out, or he didn't care and he was just writing books and and, and trying to trying to pull some money before he died. Would be my guess. But um, that's that's. Uh, uh, by the way, for those people who uh, like Dune, definitely check out the last podcast on the left, Dune Dive. It's the fucking funniest thing I've ever heard. Uh, so good, Henry Zabrowski and Holden McNeely. So fucking hilarious, Preston. You gotta you gotta listen to it too. What they it's just so like make, they just like, I mean, love Dune but make fun of it at the same time. Like kind of like what we do. They with love and fire. W- one of them, it's kind of like us in the sense, but more on crack. Like one of them is mm. like a Dune super fan, and the other guy is just like knows about it. And, and one of the guys just breaks out into like characters randomly on the spot. It's the I almost thing. feel I'm. I oh, almost yeah. Put your hand in the gum jabal. Like, he just breaks out into random characters. I, I almost feel like we should just like eventually break down into that, like like re- reassessing all of our <laughs> scenes, like like John John and Egret's like oral sex like um uh <laughs> scene. How did how did you know about that? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm time traveling. Bran like sent me a message. <laughs> <laughs> The Werewoods. The Werewoods sent me a message. That's why there's a face on all of the Werewoods. Um, so George R. R. Martin is a feminist. Uh, it doesn't make sense for Danny to be Nisa. Nisa, a character whose only purpose is to give power to the men. How will that be subverted? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that... that Dan- um, well, I mean, you know, taking that sword at the end. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think... In the end, like John is supposed to be considered a hero. Uh, uh, I think the only thing that's might be like Danny being a villain thing. The only thing that's kind of like feminist about it is the fact that like, hey, I'm not going to hold back and not have a female character be a, a, be a villain. Like they're allowed to be villains too. Um, you know, it, it, it's this is kind of like the Demolition Man kind of like um, uh, idea of 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 like progress and like race, you know, like demo in demolition man, like a black guy is the villain and the white guy is the, the hero. And we don't even think about it. You know, we don't even think about like that dynamic. It's just something that is in the story. It's not, it's not a, like a, a racist, like, like, Oh, black people are evil. White people are good kind of thing. It's just, you know, the villain happens to be black and the hero happens to be white. And the movie, the movie works. Um, I'm not saying it's the best movie, but the movie works, you know. Uh, And so it's kind of this like progress on race that we can like have a story like that and cast it as we want and have it work. Um, I mean, it might George might be thinking that with Ice and Fire that oh, you know, I can have a female villain and let's have a female villain like, you know, um, is that not the most feminist thing to do? Is to not hold back. yeah, but I think also like John being like the classic hero is also like the wrong way to look at the story. So, you know, that there has to be something horrible about John as well. Um, uh, 
in order to for it to really fit with 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 uh, George R. R. Martin because he's not he's not into heroes like saving us any either you know so um, and that kind of stuff so uh, I mean the way the show ended is not is not it's not like the farthest thing from what I think George R. R. Martin would do because um, like. John doesn't save anything. <laughs> he's not, he doesn't save anything. <laughs> like he's just he just kills Danny. That's it. <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't save the world. <coughs> Arya does, right? So um thoughts on the Winds of Winter being the worst novel of the series. Not possible to fit so much story into 1400 pages. Will not prog- progress at all. Game of Thrones season 8 bad. Um I think that realistically, if The Winds of Winter came out, I think The Winds of Winter would be like A Dance with Dragons in that you're kicking... A Dance with Dragons, if it has weaknesses, it's it's that it's kicking the plot down the road. It's like George doesn't quite know what to do, so he has the characters kind of like spin their wheels in place and kick the plot down the road oh, we're going to have this major cool thing later. Let me kick the plot down the road. You know? Um, and so, like, actually having... Like, I've seen, like, previews of, of or, where people are like, oh, my God, Winds of Winter has to be the most incredible thing ever. Think about all the great things that are going to happen. Battle of Ice, Battle of, Battle of Fire, Battle of Steel, Battle of Blood. Like, Jamie and Brienne, like, facing Lady Stoneheart. Cersei's trial by combat. Um... Like, all of these different things that have to happen. Like, uh, dealing with Bran and time travel. All this stuff. Um, but it's also George. Like, he's been he's been spinning his wheels for a long time. He's been spinning his wheels for literally 20 years. Like, is he really going to change all of a sudden and be like, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Or is he going to put it off? Like, put off a lot of stuff until the next book. Um, and so I kind of feel like a lot of that would be, is going to be, is, so I don't think it would be the worst in the series. I think it would be similar to dance. And like when I, when I, when I think about like, like look at the Arian sample chapters, that's just putting off events. Like nothing happens in them, but you're building up to something that's going to be really cool. And then nothing happens. Even the Forsaken chapter, which is a fucking incredible chapter, I think perhaps one of the best ones he's ever written, it's still a build-up to something cool that's not happening here. Right? It's still a build-up to a big, massive battle. Um, so, I... Uh, I mean, I, I think... I don't think it's going to... I don't. If it comes out, I don't think it's going to be horrible. I think it's going to be... It could be like Feast and Dance, you know? It's 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 hard for me to imagine like a book as bold as a storm of swords happening. The sequel book that everybody's been looking looking forward to since nineteen ninety nine. I have faith. I have, I have faith. faith. I have faith. Storm of swords. Part two. Part two. Yeah. Yeah. Boogaloo. I have faith. Um. Friend says solution to homelessness is to legalize normalized squatting, and I can't think of a stupider solution. Thoughts? Um, I don't think legalizing and normalizing squatting is the solution. What happens in those situations is um, uh, the, the the squatters end up claiming land and and keeping it as their own. Um, they, they, they privatize it. Um, I once went to, uh, there is a military base in um, Copenhagen called, called Christiana. And at one point it was abandoned and they hadn't put anything there. And a bunch of homeless squatters all just squatted there. And... You know, they got caught up in the bureaucracy. Oh, we can't kick these people off. Like, oh, what are we doing with the, the with the place? And so it just became a squatter haven with um where where it's not really policed. There's there you can you can go in and buy and buy drugs and all sorts of things and um and so 
it's weird, you know, it's like this big hippie commune slash um, homeless area. But, you know, I went to it and I walked around and I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm walking around, like walking up the paths of the forest past people's houses because they've built houses now. And I've never felt more unwelcome um, walking around someplace. Like everybody's just like, what are you doing here? Get it, move, leave. This is my, this is my area. This is my house. Like this is my yard. And I'm like, I'm just on the road, you know? Like I've never, I've never, like it, they treated it like it was a gated community. Like, what are you doing in here? Uh, go back to like the square where people sell, people sell the drugs and like stay away from my house. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think like legalizing or normalizing squatting is the solution. Uh, I think um, I don't think there's a, there's an easy solution to homelessness. I think you you have to make cheaper housing, obviously, and you know we've got to hit more housing, cheaper housing. We have a lot of vacant ha- homes right now. Um, there's more vacant homes than than homeless people in America. So it has something to do with like hoarding of hoarding of resources and hoarding of wealth and not pricing things and and creating artificial scarcity and stuff like that um, that they're doing. With, with regards to with, with with land I mean the same thing with land is happening like with diamonds right like they create artificial scarcity you know so I, it's I, I don't I certainly don't think it's normalizing squatting that that's just it's another thing where you're just kicking the can down the road they're just gonna privatize now they have that land and then a new batch of homeless people are gonna come around because um, what are you gonna do normalize squatting they're just gonna you know I'm just like every, like every park in DC would just be filled with tents and then when the co- like the cops can't like clear them out eventually those tents are going to like be hovels and those hovels are eventually going to be ho- like houses and there's not going to be any parks anymore so um um why do other Westeros lords allow the Lannisters to control so much of the kingdom's gold deposits Roman Carthage warred over Spain for decades uh, <clears throat> yeah, this it seems quite silly. Um, the other thing is that, like, realistically, like, if you just wanted to um, bankrupt them, it's just be like, you know what? We're only going to use silver. <laughs> like, I guess maybe the rest of the world uses gold, so so the Lannister gold would still have value. Um, so you'd have to have Esos like do it do it at the, at the same time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little, it's a little odd. There must be like smaller gold deposits somewhere else. They can't have monopoly, right? That just seems, seems a little, rather, rather silly, um, that, that they would, uh, that they would be the only people with gold in the, in the world. Um, but I mean, even when we talk about like, when we're talking about Dune and like spice and how ridiculous, like, like. Spice, of course, is like this metaphor for oil, right? Like you have this desert planet where, where there's only only spice comes from there and everybody kind of wars over it. It's like, oh, right, that's the Middle East and oil and everything. But like oil, oil is found in other places. Like the Middle, like the Middle East doesn't really have a monopoly on oil. <laughs> like it's a little, little ridiculous. So I think maybe that's the situation, that there is other gold. It's just that Lannisters have, have a lot more, have a lot more of the gold. Um. Uh, da, 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 da. Also, why would anyone war with the Lannisters over the gold? Wouldn't that be breaking the king's peace? I'm sure it happened before Egg on the Conqueror, yeah. but sure, at, that, yeah. at that point, sure. they have enough gold to where they can hold their own and you know insert political influence across all the Westeros yeah. to uh, ease certain assaults. Um. The. Uh, um. Yeah, and, and you know, I've I've read a lot of econ articles about Westeros because some people try to make sense of like the economics of Westeros and stuff like that. And you know, spoiler: the economics doesn't make sense. Okay, it's like you can try to make sense of it. George isn't that great with economics. There's 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 so much that, does, that just doesn't work. But I did read an article that was like that was like realistically, the Lannisters would never be the richest people in Westeros. The Tyrells would be like by far 
the 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 richest people of Westeros because they have the freaking food, right? And like in medieval times, like like food is much more valuable than than, than shiny metal. Um, like it, it's it's just kind of like only you know like the birth of like money and 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 other things to buy um you know kind of even comes later like you know like the most of the world still was like bartering crops with each other and like you know yes coin existed in ancient rome and all of this but realistically most people like day to day didn't use coin they just bartered their crops you know and like the tyrells have the most resources by far um so they should have like all of the power and in some ways they do they have the largest army um but you know it should be even larger it should be like you know they sh they should have the most political influence of, of, of everybody but um um uh, preston would you go on the adam friedland show uh he's one of the guys from come town right um carmine I have no idea. I don't know much about Come Town. Uh, I've tried listening to a couple of their podcasts, and I'll be very honest. It's kind of like, uh, what's that podcast you listen to with the Australian guy? And you're like, it's not that funny, but they clip out the funny parts. What's that one? Oh, I, uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Sunday Movies and the Weekly Planet. Right. It's kind of like Mr. Sunday Movies. Like, they're just a bunch of shitheads. And that's not a necessarily an insult. They're just a bunch of dudes hanging out, shitheads, and every yeah. now and then... There's like a five minute clip that's fucking hilarious. Yeah, and and it is funny. I like I've listened to a, a little bit where I'm just like, wow. When they have nothing to say, they just kind of try to talk about like you know dicks and, and and try to be vulgar. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And like like what what can I think? We're, we're talking about an issue, and then how can I make it about like you know dudes fucking? And it, is it going to be funny? Like, okay, let's. Uh, we got Auschwitz mm. and we got dudes fucking. Like, how 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 can we how can we like combine these things together? And then all of a sudden, it's you know, they're talking about Holocaust. Porn Even or that something. Uh, that yeah. that Tucker Carlson <clears throat> that we uh, we reference <clears throat> often. Like, it's five minutes of like a, a really funny Tucker Carlson impression. Yeah. But you're right. They always try to like put uh, cock in my ass and that's gonna. Get <clears throat> uh, or yeah. <laughs> or or you know this this and this. It's yeah. Now I have I have seen bits of the 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 Adam Friedland show. He's he's this. I would almost <clears throat> he is one of the guys from Cometown, but but I would almost describe his show as like Andy Kaufman esque because it's like really weird experimental comedy that's like not laugh out loud funny, but often like really kind of odd and awkward. Like he would he would have like I saw a clip where he has <clears throat> clearly a guy who's like very medically ill. And then, like, some New Jersey Guido. And the two of them are discussing abortion. And, like, the guy that's, like, medically ill is, like, like goes on, a, like, coughing, hacking fits for, like, two minutes straight. Like, like Giles Rosby kind of stuff. And it's, like, not funny, but it's, like, really weird and, like, awkward. Like, why is he doing this? But, you know, obviously I would go on any of these shows. Like, I th I do think he's 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 an interesting, weird, funny guy. But it's, like, a it's a very different kind of, like, um, humor. Like, experimental almost. Um, but, um... Oh, and Hitch as well asked about thoughts on Twin Peaks. I I really I I haven't watched the new Twin Peaks. I watched the original Twin Peaks and Fire Walk with me, and I had a certain interpretation of Twin Peaks in my head. And then the continuation kind of was like, no, your 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 interpretation is like not there. It's much weirder. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. Um, and I never I never really uh, went further further into it. Um, so I mean, I, I I liked Twin Peaks a lot. Um, and, and I liked Fire Walk with Me a lot, actually, as a movie. But uh, I haven't. I, I just never got around to like seeing seeing eventually what happened, you know. Um, but uh, um, like my to to get into like what I was talking about. So the so like the plot of Twin Peaks, which I thought was kind of weird and strange, is that like this town, Laura Palmer, this girl, has been like raped and murdered at the beginning of the story. And 
it's a it's a who done it at first on like who killed Laura Palmer, but then you have and things are really weird in the town and this FBI agent, uh, play played by Kyle MacLachlan like comes and is like trying to figure out this like mystery, but at the same time he's it's eventually kind of weird that he's obsessed he becomes obsessed with Laura, but you also find out that everybody in the town was obsessed with Laura, and you know he's in love with Laura, but like Laura's dead. And the, the town is obsessed with Laura and can't get past Laura and she's dead. And everything's really weird and, and you eventually figure out there's like aliens and a one-armed man and... and um, What? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. I've never seen Twin Peaks. That, that just interests the fuck out of me. Mm-hmm. And it turns, it turns out that the, the guy that kills Laura Palmer is actually a, a body-hopping oh, wait, wait, wait. consciousness. Why are you... Oh. I mean, the this, this show came out like... The show came out like thirty years ago. What? 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 what, what he's, yeah, a, I, he's a body hopping consciousness who who, who oh. body hopped into her father, and her father ended up like, well, not her father because her father was like horrified that this body hopping consciousness called Bob like went into his body. But like, what's horrific is that she's like molested and murdered by the body of her father. You know, uh, being controlled by by a body hopping like malevolent evil consciousness anyway and so fire and that, and that, and this is this is how it, this is even worse okay you so because you grow the whole the whole series you're like the protagonist um Kyle mclaughlin agent cooper like is trying to catch the dude and then at the end of the series the last episode They've, they've caught the dad, they've arrested him, but the body hopping consciousness takes over Agent Cooper. And uh, and that's the end of the series. And you're like, what? Oh, God. Like, it's, it was, hey, it was just this punch in the gut. And so when Fire, Fire, then years later, Fire Walk With Me comes out. And everyone's like, oh, my God. Like, the heartbreaking end to Twin, to Twin Peaks. And so Fire Walk With Me comes out, and it's like a prequel movie. Where you're like, why do we need a prequel movie? But there's a little bit of sequel in it. And the little bit of sequel is that there's this place called, like, there's this, like, cabin in the woods where consciousness can be taken out of people. And, like, that's where Cooper's consciousness is. While Bob, the malevolent force, is controlling his body, Cooper is, like, stuck at the, at the cabin. And so over the course of the movie, you do find that Laura's con Because one of the things that's very sad is you're just, like, it's it's a shame that Laura died. Like it's a shame that Laura died in so many ways. Cause like the entire town has gone to shit. Laura was, was, was this like interesting person and the Cooper's in love with her. Like it's just sad that Laura dies. And then over the course of the movie, you find out that Laura's consciousness is taken out and brought to the cabin. And so like, I kind of interpreted the end of the series being, well, at least like, Laura and Cooper like finally end up together in the end. All this like horrible stuff happened, but at least like finally she's safe. She didn't die and she gets to be with Cooper. But then other people are like, isn't that really like fucking overly focused on like male infatuation and like her not having agency and shit like that? And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's true. So like, so I don't necessarily think that like that interpretation was great anyway, but like, they continue on the series and it gets even fucking more bonkers and none of that, like what I'm talking about, about like Laura being safe and them being together is like part of the plot at all. So I, I don't know, but that's my, my Twin Peaks thing. <laughs> Sorry that I wrote Twin Peaks for you, Carmine. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, will you do videos based on the empire of the dawn? Um, I don't know if there's that much to, 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 I understand that a lot of people have done stuff on them, but, um, I think maybe eventually uh, I'll get into that. I don't necessarily mean like empire of the dawn, but like what was the specifically empire of the dawn, but what was the, the first civilization, uh, in Westeros and like the black oily stones and stuff like that. Like, I think we can get into, I think we can, probably do a video on like what what hints do we have of like what is ex- what exactly existed before everybody else 
Um, I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting topic. So I would say yes, though I still have my fucking queue of, of I'm still working on my, my what hatches dragons thing and, um, and other stuff. So, but I think that's a good, a good idea. And I think, uh, I think I'll probably do it. Um, pair character bowing down saying, thank you. Oh, oh, um, thank you. Uh, is there a, what's the reference here? Carmine pair. No, no, no. There's no reference. Uh, the pair is a, is a little cartoon that you can see on the oh, super right. chat on YouTube. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, I'm it's a little pear cartoon bowing down as an animated gif, and he's saying thank you for answering his question about the squatting. Okay, okay, that's that's so funny how it's like described out to me. Spice yeah, you're ready to like I I love you, man. You're ready to overanalyze the fuck out of that. You were ready, like, firing up Google and shit. <laughs> I know, I know. Spice is probably a metaphor for the spice trade. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it doesn't necessarily have just to do with oil. Um, and I, I talked about this when uh, when I when I interviewed Kevin Anderson. Is is that like um, Frank Herbert was just kind of interested in resources, and he there was a lot of like he was living out in like California, and I think. In Oregon or something and there was some discussion about like water resources there and so there it was more than just like desert and oil but desert and water and just like what resources in general do to to people but obviously the, you know when he's used when he uses so many uh, Middle Eastern references um, you know um, in in when when dis describing like uh like the Bedouin culture of, of, of Dune, you of course like think about it, you know, um, uh, you know, as well. So um, even the name like Moadib, like sounds Arabic, you know, um, <laughs> come down. Did I miss here? Yeah, no, there's a, there's a podcast of three dudes being as vulgar as possible called come down, come down. It's, and uh, they're, they're all taken off as comedians. They, they, um, um hi preston long time listener first time caller can you rank your top five cookies girl scouts oreos uh, i take your answer i'll take your answer off the air um doesn't everybody freaking love the uh um the girl scout um coconut one you know what i'm talking about carmine um, I actually have a fucking favorite that coconut I, caramel thing. That's the um, no, that's not my favorite. The s'mores oh. are the best one. The fucking s'mores are so good. I'm I'm waiting for Girl Scout cookie season to come back so I can order it online. Holy shit, it is so good. Like I want to say, um, shit. I'm sure people have already like listed it, but like um, um. Samoas, they're called. Yeah, Samoas are fucking delicious, but um, but it's not you know a good a good classic Oreo is of course delicious. Um, you know I actually am a big fan of a good uh, good oatmeal raisin. I like oatmeal raisin a lot. Um, I also like um, the the uh, the macadamia nut one with the the white chocolate thing in them. Uh, those are those are good. Those are those are real good. Um. You know, and you know, I appreciate a good chocolate chip if you don't put too much chocolate in it. But you know, people people go overboard with their chocolate and their chocolate chips. Like, come on, like get some of that cookie, get some of that cookie in there. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you know, it's there, there, there's some there's some. By the way, huh. speaking of uh, chocolate chip cookies, I gotta get on your case. What the fuck you did to my the video I uploaded yesterday. The one about Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah? <laughs> you fucked me. You fucking you you fucked me by saying Rings of Power or something good about Rings of Power and all the right wingers came out in goddamn force complaining about nothing. There's some there's some funny there's some funny um I, I so so when I write so in my own comments, like I usually respond like pretty seriously, but when I when I'm over at Carmine oh, when I'm over at Carmine, I'm just a fucking troll. And so it's it's hilarious because I'm like, 
these these aren't my yeah because i'm like these aren't my fans they're Carmine's fans so like i'm like <laughs> hey, hey we share them i just so you know <laughs> i know it's up to you i know i know but um some somebody somebody one of your one of your uh fans like like wrote something like um like i can't believe you think like rings of power was mediocre lol like crying emoji and i like right back i'm like dude i just couldn't kick you serious like using lol and crying emoji like what are you 12 like what are you and then he like tries to respond again i'm just like dude like i just like what are, are, do you need this information for your for your dirt dirt bike club like what do you like i don't understand he's like you said that the lord dirt of the rings bag, series bro. was the same as was it was the same as uh rings of power which was just like I didn't say that. Like I called, I called, I said one had mediocre you said, writing. You said the costumes were on the same level. They they were, yeah, they were on the same level. I don't know if I would agree with that, but sure, whatever. No, so the difference is only so the difference between Rings of Power and um, Lord of the Rings is is that one has uh, more high definition in the in the in the filming. Because, like, look at The Hobbit, right? The Hobbit is precisely, exactly the same costumes that are in Lord of the Rings. And they look like shit. They look like shit worse than, worse than Rings of Power. Okay? Hobbit, Hobbit costumes look worse than Rings of Power. But they're the same costumes from Lord of the Rings. Because the high definition was too, was too high. And it's, you could see every, all the details and stuff. Um... So I mean, the, there's definitely fault in like you're making stuff something too high definition. Like, stop it, like blur blur shit up. Okay, this is ridiculous. But that like, was a thing. Yeah, yeah. I remember reading about that. So I think that's definitely like, um, uh, I think that's definitely a thing. I mean, I would actually. So I would actually say in the end that like Rings of Power might have even conceivably had superior costumes to the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. But you can see every detail, so they look cheap, you know. Versus like Lord of the Rings, even, where everything even looks cool. Regardless, like it's a costume, like converse. Who cares? Mm. What 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 I find fascinating, and I sent you the screenshot. Mm. This I sent you a screenshot that happened on the com in the comment section of that video and of another video about global warming that's gonna appear. Uh, it's gonna premiere on Apple TV with with uh, Kit Harrington starring. Mm. Oh, okay. And every single time someone says. This looks woke. I always ask in the reply, what does woke mean to you? Yeah. And almost every time, nine times out of ten, huh, sure, buddy, huh, get out from under that dark rock you're living yeah. under. Yeah, you Just know what woke is. Just, How You don't believe like, Hollywood is woke? Like, like what? Like, just define it for me. Just, like, what do you mean? That's the thing just is, just like... fucking define it. Nothing destroys, nothing destroys idiocy more than a follow-up question, man. Just all, just one follow up question, and these guys fall apart. One single follow up question, and they fall apart. And then of course, and then of course, they have to project and like, you know, uh, why are you getting so triggered, homie? You're literally getting upset because Preston said Rings of Power has better costumes than Hobbit or whatever the fuck. Like you're you're yeah. literally getting upset and coming in my comment section to bitch about a fantasy show yeah. that you swear you didn't watch, <clears throat> but you know somehow everything about. It. I mean, we <laughs> there's see now. Now I feel like we need to have another fucking Lord of the Rings conversation to record this no, shit because, like, so oh my god, there's gotta be so much. Because when people are like, because people started like railing, like, how can how dare Preston say that like the the dialogue from from the Lord of the Rings trilogy wasn't fucking like banger? And I'm like, really? Like fucking Elijah Woods sitting there going, I want to hear the story about Samwise Ganji. You know, like, come on, there's some fucking horrible cringe moments in the fucking Lord of the Rings trilogy. Do you think Liv Tyler is like, they're like, the acting was brilliant. Like really fucking Liv Tyler and, 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 and fucking um, Sean Astin are the fucking pinnacle of acting. Like, no. Oh, Mr. Frodo, what are you doing? Mr. Like, come on. Like, it was fucking corny, bad shit. Like, like it's and it's fine. The whole product is still great. I still cried at various scenes of Sean Astin like delivering lines horribly and cheesily. That's fine because other stuff made up for it. Music, cinematography, like the pacing. There's a lot of things, but I'm not gonna fucking sit here and be like Sean Astin and, and Elijah Wood are the fucking are, are like fucking incredible. You know, <laughs> like it's just.
<laughs> yeah, Orlando Bloom too. Like, like am I am I fucking sitting there crying at fucking Legolas's per, like portrayal? Like, some people are really fucking good. Like, obviously, like Gandalf is 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 incredible. Gandalf. You know, um, and I think uh, Gimli. I think great fucking great fucking performance. But you know, like come on like it's it's like stop lionizing the series like it's like the original star wars i love the original star wars the acting of the original star wars is shit and if people are like how dare you say that about alec guinness i'm like well obviously sir alec guinness is a fucking man but you think fucking mark hamill and and harrison ford are like on the top of their game in 1977 you think Karen, like what the f- what, what the fuck like be re- be realistic. And then everyone's like, "Oh, the acting in in Rings of Power is horrible." And I'm like, "Who? Who? Who did a bad job?" And it's like you can find some like bit players at like Numenor, but honestly, like who did a bad job in in Rings of Power? You know. I'll be very honest. The uh, the the woman who plays the, the script for Galadriel kind of sucked, and she was a bit yeah. too impetuous and just like just it was cringe. A lot of her shit was cringe. But I loved um, Elrond with um, mm-hmm. the dwarf guy, his friend, and his and his and wife was like, incredible. Was good. I, I love the the the, I, I the so- mill the milf the milf storyline. There was really good acting there. Bronwyn. Maybe not maybe 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 not her son, but like she was really great. Um, Broadwin, it's Broadwin. Broad, 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 the MILF. Broadwin, like she considering the, the considering the role that they had to make her play, which was, oh, can you be simultaneously a mom and like a sexy muse to like lure this like elf and the leader of the fucking town in a military revolution? Like, oh, I've got to do all that fucking at once. Okay, and she pulled it off. Like. You know, Benjen, uh, Uncle Benjen did a fucking great job. The elf, the the, the oh, he was the best character. The the bl- the black elf was really was really great. Um, and that Aaron sexual Gear. tension, I don't sexual know tension all these guys between them. You don't. We watch this. We watch the same show. You don't know any of these characters. We watch the same show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and even when even when I look at Lord of the Rings, some of those actors are really great and were perhaps underutilized. Like, I think that Viggo Morrison, as someone said, is an incredible actor. Eastern Promises is a, just a banger movie. Um, but, you know, he's he's just Aragorn. Like, he doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really, you know, he's okay. He, he, he wasted potential, you know. Like, like Viggo is a better actor than the role they, they had him in, you know. I think Sean Bean... Did everything he could for 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 Boromir, I, and I think like um, he stole the scenes. Sean Bean and Boromir, like Boromir, this fucking like bit character, practically right, steals steals the fucking show. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's comparing acting and like when it's all blended together, right, with with like the the uh, cinematography and the pacing and the writing and all of these things, like. Anyway, the thing is, is like we, we we did this long thing on like, and we we went on this tangent on on Rings of Power was strong in the same areas that Lord of the Rings was strong in, cinematography, costumes, music, and yet Rings of Power was mediocre, but Lord of the Rings is great. Like, what was the what was the element mediocre? Yeah, aggressively mediocre. What was the element that made Rings of Power? mediocre when when it was when they were kind of hitting the same notes as the lord of the rings movie this was the 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 discussion we were having and um and i was you know we we were kind of coming to the conclusion that there was something else with regards to like story beats and 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 stuff like that that really pushed it um that 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 was the the thing that made it fall apart but yeah yeah it really does feel like there's a brigade, like a patrol of like weirdo right wingers who regurgitate everything Crowder and Shapiro say, patrolling every single like new Lord of the Rings video. That oh, comes I mean, out you you, you click on sure. you, know, you know where it comes from. You click on them, they're all subscribed to Nerdrotic. They're, it's all the fucking same. Like, <laughs> se- yeah, it's all the same sex. The, it's the same sexist, racist shit. Like the same, like you know, like straight from a straight up like no holds bar, like racist, sexist. You know, like. 
Um, what, what annoys me is is like I I can't say it annoys me. I find it amusing more so than anything because all I did was ask, "What do you think woke means?" And you can look at the replies to me. The replies are basically, "Oh." You know what woke is. Are you a groomer? Are you this? Are you that? A critical race theory class much? What the fuck are you talking about? Just explain to me, why won't you just answer the question? What mm-hmm. does woke mean to you? And and they just throw this and this. It's what they're regurgitating. It's what the right-wingers are pushing this week or right, this right. month about random crap. So yeah. you're a groomer if you ask what woke means to somebody, apparently. But yeah. I blame you for this. Like I, I, I forgot that like any talk of Lord of the Rings or Rings of Power brings up these assholes. I fucking forgot. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> thoughts on th- <clears throat> thoughts on visiting the Cushing Library? I would love to. It's just time. I live in Taiwan. It's it's very difficult to, and I have a family. It's very difficult to get away and like spend a week at that library, which I would love to do. I, and it would be there'd be so much material. Um. Uh, I would love to do it, but it's just it's just about like time and time and getting away. But um, you know, uh, one day, one day, maybe one day, figure it out. Um, this is not the place I expected to find Twin Peaks spoilers. We talk about some random shit, though. We talk about some random shit. So, um. Have you seen the news about the U.S. Department of Energy saying the lab leak was most likely the source of coronavirus? Yeah, we talked about this earlier. It's a bit surprising, you know. I I, I didn't think, um, I didn't think I thought it would just the you know the the Alcom's razor is just that it, it it was something that came in nature naturally. So the fact that it like somehow is related to this lab is a bit bit interesting and weird. Um, uh, <laughs> I love this. Sam takes some bad lines. Give it one hundred fifty percent. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Viggo Mortensen crushes it as Aragon. That's true. Uh, you can't. You can't deny that. Um, History of Violence is also a good. Is also a good movie. Um, that's my. That's my son screaming one hundred five, one hundred six out there. Um. Lord of the Rings had source material, Rings of Power not so much. Yeah, and actually we talk about this in our in our in our uh, podcast, Carmine, about how like when you're lifting half half of the lines from like the books, it's it, you know it sounds better, right? And it, it, same thing happened in, in the early early season of Game of Thrones. You know, those are brave no, men early out there. Of Game of Thrones had some banger original stuff. Like if you, uh, Josh, I'm, I think Josh did watch the podcast, the whole thing. Um, but yeah. like you know, what Tywin to Arya, what killed him? Loyalty, great. You love the season two scene with Theon and Maester Lewin. That was original. Uh, Cersei and Robert, I always jerk that scene off. That was original. Dave and Dan were on fire the earlier seasons. These yeah. guys for Rings of Power, I don't know what the fuck they were doing, but I think what really mm. f- fucking sunk Rings of Power before it even began was the fact that they did not try to tie it to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. And how the fuck can you compare? <clears throat> like, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings, despite what you were saying yeah, five yeah. minutes ago, is a fucking awesome trilogy. It's one of yeah, the best Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, everything made. Everything came together well with that, like, you know, there there was that, that lightning in a bottle kind of thing, everything uh, bringing mm-hmm. it together. But the, um, I think there's also something about how much gold you can spin. Like, Everybody can. Everybody's got a little bit of genius in them, and everybody can produce a little bit of genius. But producing a lot of genius consistently is is another thing, right? Like, you know, put Carmine and, uh, and, and me down for an hour, and we'll we'll have a pretty interesting discussion. But if if Carmine and I had to talk for like a day straight, we'd run out of things to say, right? You know, you exhaust that well, you know. Um, did you ever watch like Chappelle show season three, like the lost episodes? Yeah. It was just uh unaired uh, skits, right? Yeah. But they're, they're, they're no good. They're no good. Um, and it's like, it's like Chappelle was funny, but there's only so much material like you, you, you could extract from him at a certain amount of time. Like his creative juices would only produce so much. This is why when you watch Chappelle show, it's a fucking, there's so much time killing. You know, it's like you get that long intro, Chappelle show, Chappelle show, and then he comes out on stage and he introduces the fucking skit that they're about to show. And you're like, why don't you just fucking show the skit? Like, you don't need this introduction to the skit. There's nothing, you know, and, and then, then there's the skit, and then he comes back 
And he's back on the stage. He's like, okay, we need to take a break. Let's go to the, va- the, the commercials. A more killing time. You know, it's like, and so you watch an episode of Chappelle's show and there's like two skits, in the, in the whole in three skits in the whole fucking thing, right? And there's only like, so with d and I think d and are smart guys. I, I, um, I read bits of, uh, of, of their books and like, there's some good stuff in there. So like when they don't have to write everything, they can throw in some good lines and, and, and they have a talent. But when they had to do the whole thing and they're trying to rush it out the door and they got other things going on, other projects that they're trying to juggle, that's when they're, they're, they're stretched thin, you know? So I, I think it's like that. Um, some people, some people sum it up as uh, a band has their whole life to come up with their first album. They have two years to come up with their second, which is why, like, why bands have like incredible first albums and like their follow ups are never good, you know. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. Um, thank you, Ad Script. The um, Always thought that Boromir had an essential role to play in the articulation of Tolkien's themes of humanity's frailty and the power of the ring with the corruption of men. Thus, Sean Bean had had uh, plenty to work with. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a he's a brilliant, tragic character um, who who uh, who does represent humanity, right? Uh, he's the in a sense he's the most human of all of the characters, right? Um, in, in, in probably the whole series uh in, in that you know in, in his weaknesses and his and his and his strengths and things like that like he you know he's there's no there's no purity to him there's no evilness to him he's actually like a well-balanced um real human being um so and then you throw you throw one of your strongest actors into that role so it's like oh my gosh you actually take like what probably the 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 most interesting and um, layered character, and then you you throw a great actor on it, and and even though he's got such a small role, he, he nails it. So, um, I feel like a few bands have better follow ups sometimes. Sometimes, the uh, I mean, I do say that like they usually say it like it's the breakout really. It's the breakout album that's the good one. And then, and then the follow-up to the breakout is usually not quite as good. Because usually, like, the first album is actually kind of crap. Like, really, the saying is that, but, but realistically, it's like the first album is them figuring things out. And then somewhere around the second or the third album, they figure it out and they have a fucking breakthrough, fucking banger album. And then they're rushed to do the, the follow-up. And it's, it's, not, it's not as good, you know, so... Um, yeah, well, you know, Tool, the guy, you know, he's a genius and he like spends his time to like fucking like take, take his time to, to actually produce an album on time, you know, to, to put all of this genius into it. All right. Um, I've been on here a while. I got to say goodbye to everybody, but, um, thank you, Carmine, for joining me. Of course, of course. Hopefully, we can. Uh... Hey, by the way, did you uh, did you ever help out Dragon Demands with? I know this is so random towards the end. Did you ever help out Dragon Demands with his problem about uh, oh, the fi- program? Yeah, a lot of people. I, I I sent him my thing, but but you know I only know about like Final Cut Pro Ten. But a lot of people sent him good good advice on on. Um, I saw a lot of good advice on like free editing software. So I think he got. Did, he did got. you like my advice? I did. So Car- Dragon Dragon Demands asks asks um <clears throat> he asks on twitter like to a bunch of content creators like hey do you guys have any free like editing software that you could recommend and 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 carmine carmine oh gosh do, do i have a copy do i have a, a... no i'm, I'm showing i'm showing don't show it don't show no it. no it, there's nothing pornographic about it it's a good it's a so good... don't sh- you never know what youtube don't show it it's just, no, no, there's just, nothing. <laughs> let me let me look at it again. Let me look at the picture again to make sure that it's it's I safe for safe safe for work purposes. safe for work kind of thing. Hold on, where, hold on. I got you. One second. Where is that picture? Here it is. Hold 
uh oh, where, here it is here it is i'll send you oh, on, on facebook just download it if you want to share yeah it. yeah okay I, I i kind of felt bad because he tagged me in something and i'm like you know what i don't know glidus was like glidus goes carmine i thought you didn't post selfies and then glidus messages me privately goes oh i didn't see the the bottom part <laughs> So yeah, so he, Carmine, sends this sends this pic, and and, and and like I fall for it. I look at it. I'm just like, oh, that's, that's a cute girl. Why is he? Why is he? And then like it takes you a minute, minute. You're like, oh, okay. I mean, I and I'm like, okay. Him. I love him. I you know, him. cute cute woman, cute woman. You know, and so he sends uh, that. I, I fuck with him. I I fuck with him because I love him. He's he's a funny guy, and, and also because every time I make jokes with him, he just doesn't get it. Like it just it goes over his head. He just doesn't get it. So. <laughs> he's a good sport. He's a good sport. <sighs> but no, the reason I, I I bring it up is because he he's he's my super sleuth. Like whenever anything goes down with House of the Dragon news, mm. he's like the first person I go to. Oh yeah, to, he has uh, all the he has all the behind the scenes kind of kind of knowledge. That's the that's the yeah. Thing. He's yeah. the only person on YouTube doing this. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's he's, he's really he's that's his um <laughs> that's his, his his he's really good in that niche. All right, thank you everyone. I will uh I will uh, see you guys soon. Oh, by the way, um I should have uh my review of Arion three post in a, in a couple days. So um. And then uh, other things to look forward to. So anyway, and then maybe we'll talk. You want to talk about uh, Arion three or, or or the previous ones or Carmine? Or are we gonna wait and wait until uh, wait until later on that? What, what, whatever, whatever you want to do, and you want me a, a part of it, let me know. I, I okay. figured you'd want to bring on one of your editors. Um, uh, the your like one of your really good dudes who's in my server. Uh, this guy here. I thought you wanted to bring him on, and you guys can discuss it because. I know for a fact that he has a lot of like, like interesting things to say. Sure, so. sure, that's all fun. Yeah, I'm up for anybody on um, stream. Streams, streams, pretty open. Streams, pretty open. Who wants to be on the stream? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you.